right. wanted Bob wanted me to personally swear him in. So yeah. you're sworn at. Consider yourself sworn. And then Brian's going to handle the rest. Okay. Get back to another meeting. Mr. Chair, uh, we have a corn. We have a corn. Yes. Here, so. Okay. All right. Uh, give me one second. One, We're ready. Two. Ready to start when you are, Carl. Okay. Is Kurt? Uh, is Kurt got? I see he's missing. Is he? Okay, I see him now. I am here, Eric. Thank you. Okay, just want to make sure. I see a blank spot. And he I was see, driving the last and time. I see, and I see the top of John's head. <laughs> <laughs> All right, are we ready? Ready All when right. you are. Go ahead. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the <clears throat> Public Planning Board public meeting of January 28th, 2021, uh, which was scheduled to start at 7.30 p.m., but due to difficult technical issues, we are starting now at 7.44 p.m. Um, this meeting will be conducted virtually. All board members, staff, and consultants will be participating remotely. The public will be given an opportunity to participate remotely through the advertised Zoom link or optional phone number identified in the public meeting notice. Members of the public should use the raise hand feature or icon in Zoom or star nine if participating by telephone to indicate that you would like to be recognized to speak. Meeting and application documents have been made available at the township <clears throat> on township websites, uh, civic clerk um, uh, <clears throat> realm in accordance with the public meeting notice. Applicants will be presenting remotely and will identify themselves before testifying. With that, please join me in a salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice, and justice for all. For all. Nope. It was quick. Got the flag. Flag. Got flag on and off. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. Sorry. Just trying to still help the. <clears throat> okay. Please be advised. This meeting has been fully has been duly advertised according to Section Five of the Open Public Meetings Act, Chapter Two Thirty One, Public Law Nineteen Seventy Five, otherwise known as the Sunshine Law. Notice of the Twenty Twenty One Annual Meeting Schedule has been provided to the officially designated newspapers, the Township Clerk, posted on the bulletin board at the Hillsborough Township Municipal Complex and post it to the township's website. Additional notice has been, <clears throat> has been provided to communicate that this meeting is being conducted according to the governor's executive orders and pursuant to public law 2020, comma C.11, which allows for meetings to be conducted electronically and pursuant to the local finance notices recently established in the state of New Jersey. Okay, do we do the swearing in first or roll call? A uh, roll call. Okay. <clears throat> Roll call, please. All right, Mr. Santa Ramita is absent, and I believe that's it. Mr. Emick? Emick here. Uh, Mr. Chikarelli? Here. Mr. Scobo? I know Ron I was here. I don't see him. Yeah, he disappeared. Yeah, I don't see him come back in yet. All right, we'll get back to him. Mr. Pizan? Present. Mr. Wagner? Wagner here. Mr. Hashtag? Not here. No. Uh, Deputy Mayor Delcor? Not here. Mayor Lapani? Present. Vice Chair Julian? Here. And Chair Sirachi? Here. Okay, so first, we will do this. Swearing in of you want the township professionals as well, Mike. Yeah, my apologies, oh, Mr. Kinsler. I am here, Mr. Maskey. He is dialing in. He is not in. Well, he he is in, but can't can't hear us. So he's dialing in. He'll be in a second. Okay. Mr. Euro here, and uh, Mr. Bernstein slash Mr. Heck here here. All right, Mr. Chairman, I think the first order before you get to meeting minutes is I can swear it, Mr. Wagner. Yes, please do. Who I believe is the only member of the, of the board who has not been sworn in who's here tonight. So let me find my swear out. 
Raise your right hand, Mr. Wagner, and repeat after me. I will give me him. I state your name. I, Bob Wagner. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And that I will bear true faith. That I will bear true faith. And allegiance to the same. And allegiance to the same. And to the governments established. And to the governments established. In the United States. In the United States. And in this state. And in this state. Under the authority of the people. Under the authority of the people. And that I will faithfully. And that I will faithfully. Impartially. Impartially. And justly perform. And justly perform. All the duties. All the duties. Of the office of. Of the office of. Class two member. Class two member. Of the planning board. Of the planning board. Seat number two. Seat number two. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Thank Welcome you. Welcome back, Bob. Thank you. Welcome back. Okay, so <clears throat> next item on the agenda, consideration of meeting minutes. May I have a motion to approve the January 14th, <clears throat> 2021 reorganization meeting minutes. You have the eligible list, Michael? I do. Okay. Is everybody on mute? Uh, I will make a motion to approve. We have a motion. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay. Any comments from the dais? Seeing, hearing none. Roll call, please. Mr. Emick? Emick, yes. Mr. Ciccarelli? Yes. Mr. Scobo? He's still not here. Uh, Mr. Pizan? Yes. Uh, Mayor, Le Mayor Lepani? Yes. Vice Chair Julian? Yes. Chair Sirachi? Yes. We do not have any resolutions for consideration. Next, uh, regards to planning board business, we have the 2020 Board of Adjustment Annual Report that uh, was submitted to the board as per the municipal land use law. Um, Mr. Maskey, if you're able to hear us, talk to us, any comments? Mm -hmm. I'm not seeing him. Yeah, he's right. not. I haven't seen him jump in yet. So right, I'm, I'm have, texting him now. Can you comment on annual? The board, board, I believe, is in possession, Mr. Chairman, of the annual report from the Zoning Board of Adjustment. It sets yes. forth the members, the meeting dates, the attendance. Yes, we the are. Board, the board approved four C bulk variances. A number of D variances, which are use variances, including C variances. There was another application for a minor site plan approval for a different concept than normally allowed in the zone. There were two denied applications, two withdrawn applications, and a about a dozen or more that are either carried to 2021 being scheduled or on the process of being reviewed and received. Okay. 12, 12, in fact, carried or pending, which is basically the same number that were carried into 2020. Okay, thank you for that summary. Um, <clears throat> any comments from anyone on the day as a part of the board? Yeah, uh, I'd like to commend Mr. Herbert for perfect attendance. That's a great job. Yes. His vice chair may not have been too happy. He never got a chance. <laughs> I think Chicky's okay with that. <laughs> the right, so is she. Yeah. I make a motion to accept. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll Another second. Time. Excellent. Roll call, please. Mr. Emick. Emick, yes. Mr. Ciccarelli. Yes. Mr. Scobo. Still not here. Mr. Wagner. Yes. Mayor Lapani. Yes. Vice Chair Julian. Yes. 
Chair Sirachi. Yes. <clears throat> Next up is business from the floor. These are for items <clears throat> that are not on this evening's agenda. So if there's anyone in the audience uh, that would like uh, <clears throat> to make a statement to the board, again, for items not on the agenda, either um, hit the uh, icon with the hand to raise your hand, or if you're on the phone, do star nine to indicate that you would like to address the board. I am not. Seeing none either, Chairman. Yep. So we will move on. We do not have any ordinances for consideration. So we will move on to this evening's application, <clears throat> which is uh, CPE Brunswick Inc., uh, otherwise known as Seisner, and with file number 20 PV 05 MSPV. Um, <clears throat> why did the, my computer just. Okay. Excuse me, Mr. Wagner, do you need to go? Uh, yes, I need to go ahead, uh, Mr. Chairman, and recuse myself at this particular point in time. Okay. Thanks and, for joining. And Thanks, Mr. Bob. Chairman, I'm not recusing myself, but I'm leaving Mr. H yeah, I'm leaving you in the more than capable hands of Mr. Hack. Yes, to we know, you need to get your snowblower, so. I have to go get my snowblower from a reputable uh, company. I resemble that remark. Thank Mr. Chairman, all. I also want to let I also want to let you know. Uh, I believe Mr. Maskey, can you unmute yourself? I believe he is now here and joined us via the phone. Okay. I I will before I leave. While Mr. While Fred is working, I will remind the board <clears throat> that we have the campus associates application back next week. So, don't plan on going anywhere. Mr. Maskey, are you there now? Yeah, you're very, very low. If you could turn your volume up somehow. Yeah, I'm not having, I'm not hearing you very well either. Well, we okay. can hear him better. We hear you a little bit better now. Oh, uh, I think Mr. Scobo is I'm here too, Mike. Let's get him in while we're working on this. Mr. Scobo, I assume that's you? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. I guess let's let it be noted that Mr. Scobo has joined the meeting at 7.56. <clears throat> Sorry to interrupt there, Chairman. I guess we can proceed if I, I Mr. Maraski is ready for, to present the application or what's going on or however you want to proceed. Uh, I'll, I'll read it just because I know Dave's volume's down a little bit, but sure. um, good. I'll just read it. Block. <clears throat> so getting back with the Seisner application. It's block 178, lots two and 3.01, formerly lot 3A, otherwise known as 420 and 430 Amwell Road in Hillsboro. Uh, the applicant is seeking a preliminary and final major site plan approval, see bulk variances and waivers to construct two two-story mixed-use buildings, each approximately 6,600 square feet, a clock tower, 45 parking spaces, access driveways, connecting to lot 3.01 and site improvements um, <clears throat> on property in the town center, um, up in, the, in the town center zone and with the architectural and site design overlay district. And this <clears throat> was carried over while well, it was actually adjourned uh, from our last meeting with renotice. notice and um, I don't know if I need to read all the participants for tonight, or we will just, as they uh, come online, one by one to testify. Correct. Okay. So with that, uh, Councillor, I will let you take the floor. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for uh, having us tonight. My name is Cheryl Lynn Walters. I'm an attorney at the law firm of Nemad Davis and Goldstein. Can everybody hear me? Yep. Yep, perfectly. Yes, you're okay. fine. Thank you, Ms. Wolf. Thank you. All right, we are the attorneys for the applicant, CP East Brunswick, Inc. The applicant seeks preliminary and final major site plan approval with bulk variances and design waivers regarding the property just identified by your chairman at 420 Amwell Road, designated as Block 178, Lot 2. The application also proposes the construction of an egress driveway on the adjoining Bank of America lot. That's the 430 Amwell Road, Lot 3.01. 
The subject property has roadway frontage along Amwell Road, which is a county road, and US Route 206, which is under jurisdiction of the New Jersey Department of Transportation. It's located approximately 550 feet south of the Amwell Road intersection with Route 206. The site currently contains a 13 space parking lot extension servicing the Bank of America and is otherwise vacant and unapproved. The applicant has been working with the township for what I understand to be over a year now to develop a plan that promotes the township's vision for the town center district where the property is located. And the culmination of that effort is what is before you this evening. You'll see tonight the applicant proposes to construct a new upscale retail slash office development that we believe the board will find consistent with and representative of the township's vision for town center. The project excuse me, what consists of two two-story buildings with spaces available for retail and or restaurant uses on the first floor and office space on the second floor. The proposed uses are permitted in the town zone district. The applicant also proposes to construct a clock tower as an independent architectural feature, which we think makes the project stand out, as well as associated site improvements, which will be discussed in detail by our witnesses. Aside from the proposed egress driveway through lot 3.01, no other improvements are proposed on the Bank of America lot. Overall, the applicant believes the project will set a highly impressive bar for other future redevelopment in the TC district and thus will help the township facilitate its vision for the area. Notice that this hearing was duly published in the matter required by the municipal land use law and was served on property owners within 200 feet of the subject properties. Proof of publication and service of the required notices has been provided to the board clerk and thus the board has jurisdiction to consider the application this evening. In anticipation of tonight's virtual he hearing, we pre-marked and pre-submitted 10 exhibits, which will be presented to you during the course of the hearing. And I understand that I'll be permitted to share my screen as we move through those exhibits. I actually prepared the first two exhibits constituting an exhibit list and a witness list, um, which I, I'm hopeful everybody has. I'm willing to share them on my screen if you want to see them. But um, they just, I, I find in the virtual environment, these types of lists just really kind of help facilitate and keep the record pretty clean. The witness list identifies the applicant's witnesses this evening, who include Michael Ford, our site and civil engineer, Conrad Roncati, our architect, Gary Dean, our traffic engineer, Richard Crawford, our sign what I'll term as an expert, which you'll hear through his qualifications, you might actually be the first signed expert you've ever qualified as an expert with signs. And Leah Fury Breeder, our planner. A signed affidavit of oath for each of those witnesses was submitted to Ms. Paget. Um, and if it pleases the board, I'd ask that all five of those witnesses be sworn at this time, unless you'd prefer to swear them in one at a time. Yeah, we'll typically do it one at a time because we will also then uh, listen to, you know, um, <clears throat> hear their qualifications. qualifications. Okay. Okay. Also with us this evening is the principal of the applicant, Mr. Irv Seisner. Mr. Seisner is available to answer questions. And we also submitted an affidavit of oath for Mr. Seisner, just in case his testimony is requested. And he's listed on the witness list as available as needed. In addition, we have a representative of Ecole Sciences, our environmental consultants, Mr. Chris Kudazakis. We do not anticipate the need for his testimony, uh, which is why you did not see his name on the witness list. But we, again, submitted an affidavit of oath for Mr. Kudazakis, Kud, if I can say that right, Kudazakis, um, just to be safe, just in case you want to hear from him. You do have an affidavit of oath on file. So with that introduction, I'd like to present our testimony in support of the application. Of course, I reserve the right to respond to comments of the board and the public, including providing rebuttal testimony as may be needed. And I'd like to reserve the right to make a closing statement prior to the board's deliberation if we get that far this evening, which I'm hopeful that we can. Um, so with that, I would start with Mr. Ford, our civil and site engineer. Okay, <clears throat> so we can swear him in. Yeah, Mike, let me swear you in. Do you I, um, can I just get a clarification? So the environmental consultant is gonna be talking or no, or is that gonna be handled by Mr. Ford? It's probably going to be handled by Mr. Ford. He's available if necessary, but I, I think we'll be able to cover uh, everything through Mr. Ford and myself. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me, Mike, if Fred Kenzel, before you get sworn in, are you going to need to share, right? I will be sharing. Uh, I have all the exhibits ready. I, I just think it's easier for the for everybody. Okay. So, I'll, I'll make, I'll, I'll enable that while he's swearing Mike in then. Thank you. You swear any testimony you give tonight is going to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, to do. 
And for the record, could you state and spell your name, please? Yes. Michael Ford, uh, F-O-R-D, uh, professional engineer in the state of New Jersey with Van Cleef Engineering, appeared before this board numerous times. Thanks. Uh, okay. Mr. Chair, would you like me to qualify Mr. Ford further or would you? Uh, I, I will just ask him, has anything changed since the last time you were here, which wasn't all that long ago? No, sir. Okay. So unless anyone on the board had a change of heart with Mr. Ford. <laughs> okay. You may proceed. We accept you. Thank you. Mike, I'm going to turn it over to you. Maybe you can uh, share our exhibits. Yes, sir. Can this everybody is... see that? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. This is our exhibit that was pre-marked A3. It's existing features plan dated December 5th, 2019. It was part of the submittal package and the uh, only thing that's been done is it's been colorized with an aerial image. Uh, you'll see that the subject site lot um, two is highlighted in yellow. That uh, site is uh, approximately one acre in size where a two acre minimum is required in the zone. That's one of the bulk variances required as the application uh, progresses. And there's also required lot width of 50, 150 feet, whereas this existing condition is at 125.04. So we do require a, a lot with variance as part of the application. You can see it's a, I'll say a long, narrow, rectangular shaped lot with frontage on Route 206, which is at the bottom of the page. And you'll see uh, just opposite this site on Route 206 is the entrance in and out of the Nelson's Corner or ShopRite facility, which is just the east of this property. And then at the top of the page is Amwell Road. Uh, you can see the existing parking lot on that westerly portion of the site facing Amwell Road, and there's an existing access driveway to the site from Amwell Road. And that is that auxiliary parking uh, that was used at some time by Bank of America. And Bank of America is uh, just south of the subject site. Uh, it's uh, shaded in white with its existing drive through uh, immediately adjacent to uh, the side of uh, the subject site and a parking area of some 31 parking spaces on the Bank of America site where the current ordinance only requires 19 spaces. So there's an abundance of parking on, mm -hmm. the, on the Bank of America site per the current ordinance. Uh, and as was stated, there are no improvements on the Bank of America site uh, at grade other than the proposed exit driveway, which you'll see in a moment. And then finally, with regards to existing conditions, I just would like to highlight our immediate neighbor to the north is the uh, service station and what was at one time, the well is still the uh, Shell gas station. And that's, at the intersection of Amwell Road and Route 206. Maybe perhaps we can go to the next exhibit, which would be A4, and I can describe the proposed project. Okay. As was stated as part of the introduction, it's a um, proposal in accordance with the TC zone. There are two buildings proposed, uh, approximately 6,600 square feet each. They're two-story buildings highlighted in beige on the rendering with parking facilities, uh, what I'll call on the front of those uh, buildings, which is the side of the building that faces into the site. You'll see that there's an access driveway proposed from Amwell Road. That would be an unrestricted access road or driveway from Amwell Road, which is a county road. Uh, and then the uh, immediately onto the site, there's that auxiliary exit uh, lane 
or driveway from the site connecting to the Bank of America uh, driveway. With regards to access from Route 206, which is again a jurisdiction of NJDOT, uh, we're proposing a uh, right in, right out with a left turn in to the site. We do have a pending application with NJDOT and this uh, site access configuration is not unlike the access configuration that is actually currently under construction for the Hills Hillsborough Village Center apartment complex just south of this site uh, opposite uh, what I would know as the, I guess it's now it's the Starbucks uh, shopping center. It was the stop and shop so shopping center. Um, so that highlights the overall circulation. You'll see that we've oriented the buildings and the parking such that it offsets the parking access driveway. So there's not a clear shot through the site. We feel this is uh, an enhanced uh, aspect of the application providing for fluid circulation through the site, but not uh, something that would um, encourage uh, fast circulation through the site. Uh, centrally located within the site uh, is the clock tower, which is being highlighted now on your screen and pedestrian circulation that uh, connects the clock tower via walkways with walkways across the front of both buildings and a crosswalk through the parking lot, again, connecting both buildings. And then that uh, frontage sidewalk uh, has, uh, from both buildings, has uh, pedestrian access connections to both Amwell Road, where there's an existing sidewalk, and Route 206, where there is no existing sidewalk today and the applicant would propose to construct a sidewalk across their frontage, uh, which would hopefully uh, sometime in the future connect to sidewalks extending both north and south of this site. Um, with regards to utilities, there's existing public sewer and water in Amwell Road. Uh, the connection and service to facilitate these improvements, the two proposed buildings would be through service connections to that existing utility in Amwell Road. Um, so there would be no connection to any public water or sewer. Uh, there is no sewer in Amwell in uh, Route 206, but that is, you know, I'll say the preferred alternative connecting to Amwell Road where there is less traffic. And we do have uh, a uh, will serve letter from HDMUA. Uh, and as you know, the New Jersey uh, American Water uh, is the public water provider here in Hillsborough. Uh, with regards to trash enclosure, we've uh, shown and identified a trash enclosure centrally located between the two buildings adjacent to the parking area. I'll say that we've identified on the plans currently that that trash enclosure would be enclosed within the typical stockade wood fence. Uh, however, the applicant is uh, willing to upgrade that trash enclosure such that it would be a masonry enclosure uh, with um, a stone veneer finish look that would uh, be consistent with the, uh, I'll say upscale architectural elements of the two proposed buildings, which you'll see uh, with, I believe, the next witness, uh, the architect for the applicant. Um, and then also while I'm talking about the upgrade with the masonry trash enclosure, uh, you'll know that there's the uh, architectural design overlay standards for this area. And one of the uh, standards within that uh, overlay is the um, suggestion to provide for um, color, concrete walkways or stamped concrete walkways or brick paver walkways or paver walkways. You'll see on the uh, exhibit that we have across the front of both buildings, both on Amwell Road and Route 206, 
a covered outdoor patio area that is going to be uh, pavers. However, the sidewalks throughout the rest of the site are right now currently shown as standard concrete on the illustration. What the applicant in response to the review memorandums we've received is willing to do is, and we think this is a, is a good suggestion to implement, is that we would carry that paver um, theme from the patios along the walkway across the front of the buildings to the clock tower and the crosswalk between the two buildings. And then that crosswalk, again, in accordance with the architectural design overlay standards, would be enhanced to be a stamped pavement or stamped concrete walkway, as opposed to just the standard white striped walkway that's represented on the illustration. Um, so that would be, I'll say, an enhancement or an added element that the applicant would propose. The other crawl, uh, walkways that is along the sides of the buildings and the rear of the buildings that ac access service doors would be uh, maintained as standard uh, concrete walkways. Stormwater management. Uh, the applicant is proposing an underground stormwater management facility that's right in front of building two, which is the building closest to Amwell Road. Uh, there's also porous pavement proposed uh, in areas of the site to address not only um, water quality standards that you all you know, are familiar with now with the uh, new uh, stormwater management standards that have been in place for some time now, I'll say. And then with regards to groundwater recharge, which is another element of stormwater management that's required with any site plan we're proposing to utilize a stone bed under portions of that porous pavement for groundwater recharge. Um, I'm sure we'll get into it as I progress with my testimony, but I'd like to highlight now while I'm discussing stormwater management is that we are in possession of a uh, review from the Delaware Rare and Canal Commission dated June 2nd, 2020. And uh, while the um, staff doesn't recommend approval from DNR Canal Commission. Their only caveat really is that we provide proof of county and township approval. As the board members know, the DNR Canal Commission doesn't uh, release their final approval until they receive those other two approvals. But I would like to highlight in that June 2nd, 2020 review or staff report from the DNR Canal Commission, their review has found that the proposed site stormwater management facility, both quantity, quality, and groundwater recharge meet their standards and the state standards for stormwater management. And then with regards to, uh, and, and we'll get to this uh, in more detail, I think in a minute, but uh, in, in accordance with the board engineer's review, uh, we would agree to any condition of approval this board may grant that we would uh, address the, um, I'll say technically, te technical in nature comments regarding stormwater management in Mr. Euro's report to his satisfaction. So we have no objections with regards to stormwater management uh, and have already received a favorable report regarding same from the DNR Canal Commission. Hey, hey Mike, this is Neil. Yes, sir. What about the, um, the stormwater, um, the soil, um, classification that the Environmental Commission brought up relative to the, uh, the recharge, the soil type C versus D? Yeah, that's actually also in Mr. Euro's report, and that's a discrepancy reports that we would address to Mr. Euro's satisfaction. And we have done on-site soil testing that, that I'll say, you know, is even, you know, more pertinent because it's site-specific. So wh uh, what's the answer to the question? Is it is it, what soil type is it? C, C soil. Okay. Um, parking. Uh, we've provided parking for 46 spaces. Um, I know there's some discrepancies between reports, but the September 8th, 2020 revision of the site plan, that's the last revision. That's what's pending and is reflected on this illustration 
that the board is seeing is 46 parking spaces with two handicapped parking spaces. Um, with regards to uh, loading, uh, we're requesting um, relief from the one loading space technically required as part of the ordinance. Um, like other sites you've heard us uh, discuss, um, this wouldn't have tractor trailer deliveries. This would be small box truck or UPS deliveries. And you'll hear even more detail, I'm sure, from Mr. Dean, the traffic consultant for the um, applicant, um, that we don't really feel a designated loading spot is necessary. And with the applicant owning the facility, they can uh, coordinate through leases, the deliveries uh, at off-peak hours. So we don't believe that a, a designated loading spot is required. Um, and then with regards to truck maneuvers through the site, we've uh, uh, done a fire truck circulation uh, test through the site, which accommodates the township's emergency vehicle. And um, with regards to another review memorandum that we received, that is uh, a September 29th, 2020 review memorandum from Chris Winnegar, the chief fire marshal for the township uh, would state for the record uh, uh, for the board that uh, we would agree to address each and every one of Mr. Winnegar's uh, review comments to his satisfaction, including the standard uh, uh, knock boxes, uh, his uh, final say on any hydrant locations, uh, as well as fire department connection locations for the buildings, and these would be uh, sprinkler buildings. And then with regards to the facility occupants and uh, uh, hours of operation, there's not specific tenants designated as of this date, although I will say and report to the board that the applicant has received interest from uh, what were the owners and operators of Big Heads, uh, a restaurant that uh, was located in a shopping center north of this site near the Applebee's restaurant. Uh, and that um, owner uh, has expressed uh, an interest in occupying the entire first floor of building one, which is the building closest to Route 206 for a restaurant. And then what I'd like to say in general is that uh, the tenant mix uh, would be in uh, conformance with what the town center restrictions are. And there are a number of different types of uses permitted on the site, including general office, medical, as I've stated already, the restaurant uh, like Big Heads, um, and uh, what we envision is likely having a general office or office tenants on the second floors. Both buildings would have elevators. I know there was a discrepancy or not a, a clearly labeled on the site that building one would also have an elevator just like building two is identified on the site plan as having a, an elevator. Um, and then with regards to the hours of operation, we don't envision that anybody would have a 24 seven operation. Um, and uh, then with regards to parking, like the segue into that, there was uh, comments made in uh, the review memorandums regarding parking where we identify that the required number of parking for the mix uh, identified, that is the uses of the uh, two building spaces at 36 spaces where we're proposing 46. So you could see there's an abundance of parking for the tenant mix or use of the buildings identified on the site plan. Uh, but what I would report to the board this evening that we've already done a calculation for a more uh, restrictive use. That is a, a, a use of uh, both first floors of buildings one and two entirely uh, as medical or restaurant uses, which is four spaces per, for required per thousand square feet of usable floor area. Uh, and we'll uh, amend the applications to reflect what I'm stating here to show that even if 
both buildings, one and two, the entire first floor was used as a use like medical or restaurant, which has a higher uh, required uh, parking space need per the ordinance that the 46 parking spaces proposed would be adequate for those uses. So should, you know, hopefully we all risk, you know, wish the success of any uh, proposed uh, owner of a building uh, that uh, big heads were to occupy the first floor of building one, there would be adequate parking on site for that use. And again, we'll uh, amend the applications to reflect this more restrictive use and that it, the proposed parking still complies. And Mike, if I can interrupt for just a second, um, I, I just want to just want to confirm when you say we'll amend the application to show the more restricted more restrictive uses. You, do you mean we'll amend the application as far as the parking calculation chart is concerned to show that the parking would still comply? That's correct. You All know right. when we hopefully gain approval for the application and the approval compliance process. And this was actually one of the comments. So I'm really responding also to one of the comments in the review memorandums from the board's professional. There was a request to do just what I'm stating. Right, so I just wanna make sure we're clear for the board in case anybody has any questions. Um, we don't know the tenants yet, but we're, we're just trying to show worst case scenario to show no matter what, um, we, you know, parking would still comply, right? Correct. Okay. Do you want me May, to? Can I, uh, can I, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, yes. All right. Yes. Yay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. There we go. This was sort of a test. Sorry for the technical difficulties, Mike and everybody else. Um, so just to clarify in the parking. So it's recognized that if you recalculate based on future tenants and you have a shortage, you would have to be turned to the board for a variance. Correct. You understand that? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, landscaping. The the illustration um, A4 that's still on your screen uh, reflects the proposed landscaping throughout the site. Um, there are some landscape comments in the review memorandum. They'll address them to the professional's satisfaction. And then I just would like to speak, I'll say briefly to, with regards to a tree removal and tree mitigation. Um, the township ordinance restricts existing vegetation or existing tree removal at 60% for commercial operations. Whereas you can see from the tight quarters that we're uh, faced with and also complying with the TC zone standards uh, we're going to be removing basically every tree on site. So we're at 100%. We need that relief. With regards to tree mitigation, that is the either replanting on site or uh, if the trees don't fit on site for, for the calculated trees that we're moving, that the tree mitigation uh, requirement would be met by either trees being planted on site and or planted somewhere else at the you know, direction of the township uh, in the township or uh, via a cash contribution where our current calculations shown on the site plans uh, indicate a, a tree mitigation requirement of 160 trees. We're proposing 19 trees on site, which uh, provides for a shortfall of 141 trees. We're not requesting an economic hardship waiver. We'll comply with the township ordinance with that tree mitigation and the trees that we can't fit on site. So if we can add some more trees uh, while we address the, the, the um, staff's re uh, recommendations and requirements, for example, we're able to fit more than 19 trees on site and uh, anal analyze further the tree mitigation requirement, any shortfall in accordance with the ordinance would be met with a cash contribution, or if there's, uh, we can work it out with, I'll say the township planner, or uh, I think it's the rec uh, facility uh, operator that there's trees to be planted on site at the uh, applicant's discretion. That would be another way of addressing that tree mitigation requirement. Mike, 
Let me interrupt you there for just a second. Um, with respect to the calculation of the number of trees required for replacement, um, did we have not yet conducted a tree inventory uh, by a certified arborist, but we plan to do that, do we not? That's correct. Okay, so uh, um, I the recommendation- right, Wait, hold on, hold on, I gotta jump in there. Your tree mitigation plan has to be official. You just can't be a guess. No, no. Right. Um, so, I, it, let me, if I can address that for a moment, that what, I'm trying to get at with Mr. Ford. What the applicant is proposing is that with your guidance and oversight, Mr. Maskey, um, we will perform, we'll, we have a licensed arborist that will go out and do a tree inventory on site and we'll pre present those numbers to you because your ordinance has an exemption from the replacement requirement for dead or dying trees. Yeah, hold on, hold on. No, you were supposed to do the inventory as part of the application, not after the app, not after the fact. Uh, you, you submitted, you submitted a, a calculation that you require 160 trees. We're assuming that was based on an inventory, Michael. Yes, we did an inventory. I think what the attorney is pointing out that there may be you know, additional detail besides the size and species and location of the tree that wasn't identified. That is dead or diseased trees or the fact that you know, ash trees you know, might not be a tree that you would require mitigation for because they're uh, an ash tree. That's all we're saying, Mr. Maskey. Okay, Michael, you've done this before. You know how this is done. Uh, the tree mitigation plan is, is it's submitted with the application and it's the official mm -hmm. inventory. So as long as we're understanding that you required at least 160 trees replacement, you'll replace somewhere in the neighborhood of 19 and you'll make a cash contribution for the balance. Is that understood? It, defer to you. Yeah, if that's your preference, Mr. Maskey, that we don't undertake that further effort, then yeah, the, the applicant will agree to work with you to replant as many trees on site as possible. And the difference between 160 and whatever we're able to plant on site would be subject to the contribution and or replanting off site. That's fine. Thank you. Um, Let's go to the next exhibit. This is an exhibit A5. Uh, it was submitted as part of the application. It represents a conceptual um, rendering of the site built out as well as the build out of the township's vision of the future look of both Route 206 and Amwell Road that is improvements to Route 206 with the main, representing the main street uh, appearance with uh, a landscaped island down the middle, uh, one lane in both north and southbound direction, bike lanes adjacent to it, as well as opportunities for parallel parking along Route 206. And then with regards to Amal Road, and you can see in the lower left-hand corner of this exhibit, there's the cross sections that we've actually cut and pasted right out of the township's master plan for that future vision of both Amwell Road and Route 206 cross section. And with regards to Amwell Road, that would be uh, with a grass island down the middle of it where, they're not, uh, where there isn't a need for left turn lanes. And I'll, you know, obviously you know that both Amwell Road and Route 206 are under the jurisdiction of other entities beyond the township at this point. But what I would represent to the board is that this application as proposed doesn't propose any improvements that would impede uh, the future vision of the town for improvements to both Amwell Road and Route 206. And we've uh, you know, demonstrated that by the, this exhibit. <coughs> Okay. I have a question, Mike. Are you sorry? The microphone came back on. Um, I had suggested in my letter that you extend the sidewalk across the bank property and you show it on the concept plan, but it's not on the site plan. What's, what's your intention? Yeah, I can answer that, Mr. Ford. Uh, Mr. Maskey, we have a limited right to utilize the Bank of America site. Our easement area covers only the area where we show the egress driveway. Bank of America did not give us permission to do any other site work on their site and we don't own it. So that is something that we cannot commit to at this time uh, because mm -hmm. we have no authority from Bank of America and those improvements would be outside the easement area that we were granted. 
Okay, Hi, but- this is Mr. Emick. I have a question on that. Did you ask for permission for a sidewalk across her property? At the time that my client obtained the cross easement was when he purchased the property. Um, so it wasn't contemplated at that point in time. And I think he's made attempts to reach out to them since then. And has it's very difficult to get in touch with them. And we haven't received any responses. Yeah, because I, I think I picked up the same thing that Mr. Maskey did, not knowing his comment that, you know, especially with the, uh, the residential going down the street, and if like a big heads restaurant were to go into this space, it looks like it's a, a gap, a missing pedestrian connection that could be very important and it, it, uh, for the safety of, uh, you know, pedestrians and bikers. Um, I don't know. I'd, I'd like to think that at least some outreach could be performed with the actual request to put a pedestrian path across their property. Uh, if you give me a few minutes to communicate with my client while we move on to other testimony, can we come back to that in a minute? It's a little hard in the virtual environment. I can't just lean over and have a conversation, um, but I'll communicate with my client on that and, and give you a response, okay? Thank you. <clears throat> Should I continue? Okay. Um, let me highlight some outside agency approvals. I've already spoken to our pending application with DOT and the county um, with regards to other outside agencies, as well as the DNR Canal Commission. Uh, we also have already secured our approval from the Somerset Union Soil Conservation District. Uh, and uh, we have also secured uh, approval from NJDO, I'm sorry, NJDEP for the filling of an isolated wetland on the site. Um, let me then go maybe to the. Uh, hey, Mike, regarding the, um, the GP6, is that, is that a new, was that the new application? That was a modified application. They, there actually was already an approval for the filling of that isolated wetland and we modified it as required to identify the current owner and applicant of the property. So it was a modification of the old one? Correct. Okay. And it represents the plan that's identified in that permit represents the current project plan. Right, okay, I just, I just wanted to make sure it was Updated and modified. Thank you. Right, and um, that, that just to follow up, Mike, the, the 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 application I was looking at, it looked like it had the old concept plan in it for the when they were talking about a Paneros or some Paneras or something in there. It didn't look like this site plan that was attached to the permit. Am I misreading it? No, it's my understanding that the permit plan that was approved was for this this project we can we can forward that information yeah okay yeah to you to the, sure. the township uh planning department uh, mike before you continue are temporarily do you want me to stop sharing my screen are you done with your exhibit yeah i think we're done with the exhibits okay that way everybody can still see can see everybody i i frequently i have two monitors everywhere i work and i frequently forget most people don't. So I can still see you while you're looking at my other screen. I apologize. Okay. Um, maybe I've already spoken to the uh, review we, we received from uh, Mr. Winnegar. Uh, I've uh, referenced, but not specifically identified the September 23rd, 2020 review memorandum from the board's engineer, Mr. Euro. Um, a state uh, on the record that uh, there are many, I'll say housekeeping items in there. Uh, and I hope that uh, during my testimony, I've highlighted and addressed uh, the, the questions or uh, items that were requested to be identified in uh, testimony. And uh, as I stated earlier, the applicant is any, as a, a condition of any approval the board may grant, would agree to address each and every one of the uh, comments in Mr. Euro's letter to his satisfaction. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ford. This is Mr. Euro. Just a, a couple of questions for, for the record. Uh, my September 23rd, 2020 letter, page seven, 
which is under the stormwater section D. So if you go down to item, um, uh, it would be D4. If you can just provide a little testimony regarding any drainage impacts um, from lot one and how they're being mm -hmm. handled via your drainage system. Yes, sir. Yeah, the lot one is uh, the gas station lot. That is the lot northeast or north of our property, uh, which actually drains onto our property. So uh, we'll have no adverse impact to uh, the drainage on lot one and actually have uh, as part of our stormwater management system design uh, implemented or shown um, head walls and inlet pipes that would allow for the drainage to continue from lot one onto our site through our stormwater management system. Okay, thank you. On page number nine, uh, section E under the utilities and grading, item number two, I know you identified that um, you're getting your water from New Jersey American Water. First, have you had any preliminary meetings with them? And second, um, will they be required, requiring you to have a meter pit in a hot box? And third, if so, where will that be placed on the plan? Okay. Um, we have uh, contacted New Jersey American. Um, the, uh, the, they won't really, the next step really, since this is not even a main uh, extension, it's just a water surface application as part of the construction permit process for the buildings and other utilities, there would be a formal application. Uh, so that hasn't, to, to New Jersey American Water, that hasn't been submitted yet. But to answer your question regarding the meter pit and the hot box, uh, we've seen uh, on uh, all applications recently that uh, the, the New Jersey American Water requires that. Um, in this case, since we're proposing our water surface from Amwell Road, the water meter pit and hot box would likely be located along the uh, Amwell Road frontage. And I'll say the only exception would be is uh, on some cases, uh, they would allow it, you know, that to be located within the building. That is the, the meter and the, then you wouldn't need a hot box. But uh, if it were required, that's where it would be located. Okay, um, and just to follow up on that, if if a hot box is um, to be put on the on the site, which is for everybody's um, edification, is just it's a big silver box. It sits out there in the middle of the grass. I would just ask a, ask that that be adequately landscaped for screening. And we can do that. And then why why we're talking about utilities? I don't think during my testimony I answered one of your other questions, which was the location of um, the AC units, uh, we would uh, anticipate that they would be located uh, adjacent to the foundation of the buildings and we would locate them on the interior side of the site that is uh, right now, I'll say on building one, would be at the rear left corner of building one. Um, that's the lot that the building that faces route 206 and I'm speaking rear left corner as you face the building from route 206. And then at the rear of building two, that is uh, I'll say in that area where, where we had the three parking spaces and the trash enclosure. And these would be small, you know, condenser units. And any further questions in that regard can perhaps be addressed by the architect who will testify next. Okay, thank you very much. That covers all of my concerns. Thank you. Uh, Mike, if you don't mind, I, I apologize that before I was offline there for a little bit. I know you may have covered some of the points in my memo. I'd just like to quickly backtrack a little bit. Um, all right, so you covered the, um, <clears throat> and I'm not sure if I, you have a planner, I guess she's going to be testifying about the actual variance relief. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so you noted those. Uh, you talked about the parking. You'll we calculate that as needed. Uh, you needed a waiver for the deficient stall size. The, uh, 
excessive coverage, covering more than 30% of the lot frontage with the parking. I believe you touched on that. Um, all right, yeah, the, so the access through the bank lot, and I, I see it, it changed a bit from the last version from the informal concept that you submitted. So if, correct me if I'm wrong. So from your site, you can exit out through the bank but you can't enter from the south, correct? Because that's a one-way, your easement across the bank property? Uh, the easement doesn't restrict the, the right. access. But uh, you, you've the, narrowed it from the original version. That's correct. Right. Only exit only. So it's exit only. Okay, so if someone comes in from the uh, Bottle King Shopping Center, they can't access your site, correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, and did you address, and I don't know, maybe, maybe uh, the traffic engineer will address the, the whole in, right in, right out only on Amwell Road. Is that gonna be addressed later according to the, the county's request? Yes, Mr. Dean will address that. Okay. Um, I believe you said um, the sidewalks and the crosswalks, they would not be enhanced uh, per the ASDO. You'd be looking for waivers for that, is that correct? Actually, in my testimony, I described that um, that paver pattern that we show under the two porches, the covered porches along the frontage of both buildings one and two facing the road. Yeah, that that um, uh, walking surface characteristic would be would be carried across the frontage of the buildings, Mr. Okay. Maskey, to the okay. clock tower and through across to the frontage of you know, and connecting with the other building. So uh, the only, I'll say, portion of the sidewalk that we wouldn't have enhanced or colored and then just have standard, I'll call it, call it standard sidewalk, would be the sidewalk that is down the sides and at the rear of the buildings that kind of services just, you okay. know, the utility build rooms. Okay, and some, is someone else gonna talk about the sign package? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, the refuse area, I think the only thing you were missing was the hose connection. I believe you kind of took care of the other requirements. Is that right? Yeah, on building on building uh, two, the one closest down Wall road and closest to the trash enclosure, we yeah. can provide for a hose bib there so that that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, tree mitigation we talked about. Uh, you're looking for a variance. You're not intending to meet any of the green technology requirements. Is that correct? That's actually not correct, Mr. Maskey, but our um, architect will be addressing that. We, okay. He will be indicating that the, the project will be able to, to uh, will be meeting minimum lead requirements. Okay, thank you. All right, that's it for now, thanks. Uh, Mr. Ford, I uh, just want to circle back to one thing. There was a comment in the reports regarding the average foot candle for the proposed lighting on the site. Could you address that? Yes. Uh... They're actually the the three point four that was uh, identified is actually the maximum under one of the light fixtures, but the overall average on the site will meet that 0.5 uh, standard. So we do comply. Okay. And Can I ask a question regarding lighting since we're on that topic? Um, obviously, with it being in, the, and I couldn't tell from the plan. So please, if it's there, I pardon me because we're looking at a computer as opposed to a piece of paper. Uh, since this will be in our town center zone and we'll have sidewalks and hopefully people walking to, if it is a restaurant at night, is there illumination, low level illumination along the sidewalks uh, coming from 206 uh, into the entrance of the uh, facility? Yeah, our, our lighting plan addresses that and actually specifically says the average lighting intensity, intensity on all walkways. Okay, thank you. And I just want to uh, touch back to the trash uh, enclosure or the, the trash itself. You indicated that you had supplied a fire truck turning template to the fire official um, that shows a fire truck can maneuver throughout the site. Uh, did you run a truck turning template for a trash pickup vehicle to ensure yes. that, that could be accommodated as well? That can be accommodated as well and we can add it to the site plans. 
Okay, and then coming back to the question earlier about the sidewalks along Bank of America, I just want to let the board know that I communicated with my client and he has reached out to Bank of America. He will continue to pursue that. And if they'll give him the permission, he'll install the sidewalks. I would ask though that the condition of, of any approval associated with that, you know, make accurately reflect the fact that we need Bank of America consent for that. Um, we're willing to put it in as long as we can obtain that, that consent from Bank of America. And that's the 206 frontage we're talking about, correct? Correct. Okay. Is there any of that, David, in the uh, easement of 206 as far as getting approved? That, that's what I was wondering, if any, don't the sidewalk be in the right of way? Yeah. I defer to Mr. Ford. Mr. Euro, Mr. Euro or Mike, wouldn't it, doesn't the sidewalk generally wind up in the right of way anyway? Well, if we're going to accommodate it for that future, you know, right. so that it can stay, uh -huh. it would be too close. You know, okay. that doesn't really match up with then the right. future vision of Route 206. Okay. So we don't need approval from 206. We can, that we're, what you're getting at. Well, it sounds like what, what from Mike's saying, uh, yeah, because the, when you put in the uh, the future parking lane, sidewalk, bicycle lane, et cetera, the sidewalk's really back further than, it. if you put it on now, you probably would be in the 206 right of way, but that's not where we want it. We need it back a little further into the site. So yeah, I guess for now it would be on the bank property. Does that sound right, Michael? Yes. Yeah, okay. So do the best you can. <laughs> okay. All right, um, and Ms. Ed, Mr. Maskey did mention, and I don't think we talked about it all, Mike, so if you would just provide a little bit of testimony regarding the parking space size. We did. We are requesting a waiver from the requirement for 10 by 20. We're providing 10 by 18, but can you confirm for the board that we can still accommodate the same size vehicle with hangovers or through any other uh, attenuating measure? Yes, uh, we're uh, compliant with the access aisle width, so the Access drive through the site is 30 feet wide in accordance with the ordinance. Uh, the only, I'll say, portion of the parking space size that we're requesting a, very, uh, a waiver for is the depth of the space where we're proposing 18 feet and 20 is required. But in all locations for parking, there's ample room for an overhang of two feet beyond, you know, or at the curb line. So um, that's our proposal. So we're meeting the intent of the ordinance in that yeah. in that yeah. way. Okay. And then the other uh, waiver regarding parking was that no more than ten parking spaces per side. We're providing twelve. Is that correct? Yeah. There's there's one location. Uh, this is uh, a, a requirement in the TC zone where no more than ten spaces are in a row without a landscaped island between them. But uh, and we accommodate that in all respects throughout the site but for along our northerly property line facing the gas station where the trash enclosure is located, we have 12 spaces in a row without a landscaped island in, in, uh, interrupting them. So, so we're uh, two over the 10 max in a row permitted in the ordinance and require relief for that condition. And then there's also in the ordinance, uh, not under the town center zone, but another section within the ordinance it requires a 30 foot setback for parking from a property line. And obviously with this site and, you know, being in compliance with the, you know, the thought pattern of the development of the town center zone, we're uh, not going to be able to accommodate the 30 foot setback for parking to a property line and would require relief. And that's a waiver as well, correct? That's correct. Okay. Just that's checking it. notes. That's I believe that's all we have for Mr. Ford, unless anybody has any other questions for him. There was a couple of other on the parking. You need the variance for uh, you're not allowed to have more than 20 cars for double-sided parking. You actually have 21, so it's, it's minor, but it's there. And the um, requirement that no more than 30% of the lot frontage along the street. Uh, be occupied by driveway and, and parking, you need a waiver from that. Yes, and with the narrowness of this lot, 
in order to just get a driveway in, uh, we've uh, endeavored to take up as little amount of that frontage as possible. And I think the architect will go into it in more detail next. The uh, development of the building architectural uh, elements have actually changed since we met with this board over a year ago informally where we heard uh, a desire to provide for a more building frontage facing both roads. And uh, I believe the architect has uh, accomplished that with the architecture you're about to see. Any other questions? Yeah, I thought I saw in one of your plans, is there a parking lot easement that you that is depicted on the plans? Are you sharing spaces? No, we're anybody? not sharing any spaces. But, it, okay, what, what's the parking lot easement then that is depicted? Something on one of your illustrations, yeah. what's that for? So if I can go back to that, let me show you this exhibit A3 real quick. I think if, let me know if this is what you're talking about so I can make sure I'm answering your question. Are you talking about this, the existing parking field here? Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. But on, I guess on the proposed plan, it's still shown. Well, on, yeah, on the proposed plan, and I can switch to that. It So currently, my understanding is, and Mr. Ford can correct me if I'm wrong, this is a parking field that's utilized by Bank of America. It was sort of an extension of their parking that they utilized at one point in time. We are no longer going to have that connection with Bank of America for parking. There's not going to be a cross parking agreement. There's only a cross access agreement with Bank of America now. So yep. this parking that you see here will be part of all of that area is now part of the new lot. Yeah, and my, my confusion is if you still look at that, it still says existing parking easement right underneath. That That's why I was curious if in the public, we're still going to have a shared yeah. No, and we that are not. not the case. That is not the case. Okay. So, um, Mr. Euro here, I would just ask Mr. Ford, just when you make your plan revisions, um, on that site plan sheet, existing parking easement to be extinguished, eliminated, removed, just so there's a notation moving forward. Okay. Thank you. While, while we're on A3, uh, this is John Ciccarelli. Uh, curious about the line on the north side with uh, the, the trees that kind of overlap both sites, uh, site one and, and your site. Um, you know, it's kind of, I assume it's hard to draw a line there that, uh, you know, says take this tree out and, and, and leave this one. But so can you, can you talk about your tree inventory, what it accounted for and how that's going to be handled? Because I know the, 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 the building structure is right on the property line there too. So uh, are more trees going to have to possibly be removed and then replanted? And uh, how would that be handled with the property owner on the, uh, the shell property? All right, so if I understand your question, you're, you're talking about this yellow line here? Yes. And okay, and, and of the course- trees it's, it's on both side, The trees kind of on both sides of it. So right. um, just can you contain that tree removal to just where that line is? It's kind of hard. So. Uh, just don't know if there's a mitigation plan if you have to rip out a couple of trees that are on the other side of that just because your dozer, you know, because uh, of how the tree is, is, is situated. So I'll defer to Mr. Ford on that. But we've already, we've agreed, like Mr. Maskey made it clear we, we got, we have the ordinance to address. We have a plan that we've already shown the existing trees uh, and we can show tree protection along our uh, northerly property boundary. So there's no, uh, you know, chance that there would be uh, um, a stray construction vehicle, for, for example, to a, a neighboring property. Uh, and um, I'll say, you know, as hard as we try to get this all exact, there's always circumstances or issues that come up through construction. I'd like to say that we never use the revision block on these plans after they go to construction, but there's always, you know, potentially items that come up and uh, throughout construction, the township engineering department does inspections and we constantly are interacting 
with not only the Township Engineering Department, but Mr. Maskey's office for any minor changes that, uh, including something like you're, uh, you know, suggesting might potentially happen and they address it at that time. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I had a couple of follow-up questions that came up at the Environmental Commission. So, Mike, are you still planning on using some, some porous pavers to help with the stormwater management? Correct. And then um, the issue of the migratory bird treaty, which um, we requested the tree clearing be restricted from April 1st to August 31st to avoid injuring any um, injuring or killing any nesting birds. Could you address that? Yes, uh, uh, we would uh, prefer that uh, a restriction that's, that, that like that has been suggested not be imposed on this applicant. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's, we've already shown of the one acre lot probably about half of it is pavement already for the parking. And there's only about another half acre or less of the vegetation. And what I'd like to point out also is that the DEP permit, which the board knows often imposes restrictions like the one suggested by the Environmental Commission had no such restrictions uh, suggested or imposed uh, as part of that DEP permit. So our preference would be that that, that restriction not be imposed. And I can actually take that one step further for you. Um, on January 7th, 2021, the Federal Division of Fish and Wildlife issued a new issued new rules and regulations specifically applicable to the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. It's an interpretation. Um, it, it's a really long legal history that if you want to hear it, I can bore you with it. But the bottom line is the new regulations actually detail the difference between what's prohibited under the act and what activity is not. Prohibited activity includes any intentional killing, injuring, maiming, uh, taking, or otherwise impacting of migratory birds or their nests. But the new regulation in the um, Code of Federal Regulations, the, it makes it clear it's based upon a solicitor's opinion. Um, it makes it clear that incidental relocation or disturbance of migratory birds during uh, non-intentional activities, which they define as things like it, things to include commercial development, are not prohibited by the act. So with that, in conjunction with, Ms., with Mr. Ford said, um, the federal law as newly interpreted by, well, it's newly, newly put into place. I, I actually printed it and read that if you'd like I could share it with the board solicitor. I did mention it to Mr. Hack earlier today when I talked to him, um, but that we don't think that the Migratory Bird Treaty Act based upon these new regulations actually prohibits conduct or otherwise allows um, or requ otherwise requires a limitation on that period of clearing. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd have to read that act, but um, based upon what I know, um, I mean, I'm taking your word for it, but um, I'd have to clarify that. And it, what DEP permit are you talking about that would, that doesn't the, restrict that? The GP, we have the GP6 for the filling that, of the isolated that addresses, wetlands. That addresses the Migratory Bird Act? No, what I'm saying is, as you know, like often in the DEP permit, uh, there's conditions of the permit which actually restrict the actions uh, allowed by the permit to certain times of year. And in this case, the, like, for example, the, for the regarding bats, um, this permit didn't require any restriction. It's just a point of fact. Yeah. I mean, that permit was for filling the wetlands. I don't think it had anything to do with the Migratory Bird Act. So I'm not sure I agree with you with that. So, um, and then I'm not sure about the clarification with the Migratory Bird Act. So, I mean, I could go back and ask some of the more subject matter experts on the Environmental Commission because I'm not as familiar as you are um, with that act at this point. So, and it just literally they just adopted this rule. There's a circuit split between the federal district courts as to whether or not the Migratory Bird Act prohibits the type of activity um, that we're discussing here, and, and and or requires limitations on when that activity can occur. And this new opinion that, or the new regulations they just adopted on January 7th of this year 
go into effect shortly are based upon a, a solicitor's report from the, hold on, I have that too. Office of the Solicitor of the United States Department of the Interior. And, it, and it's that one, it's also 43 pages and they go in detail about the history of the Bird Act, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act and what its intention is. And it talks all about incidental taking. That was the whole point of that decision or that opinion and now the regulations. What happened was somebody appealed that solicitor's opinion to district court, to a, a federal court. That federal court recently said that it was no good. And in response to that, the division of Fish and Wildlife said, okay, you might not like the opinion, but we're gonna implement what it says in regulations and that's what they've done. So those regulations are now binding. And we would submit to the board that while we respect the environmental commission's concerns and we share those concerns, uh, the limitation that's being requested isn't supported or isn't required by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, and we would ask that that not be imposed. Okay, as long as it's in the testimony, like I said, I I can't clarify what, what you have in front of you, so um, we'll just keep it as part of the testimony for now. Yeah, we, we would just uh, obviously submit it to our attorneys for review. I did share those those links with Mr. Hack earlier today. I'm not saying he had an opportunity we, to review it, but we, we will. I, I haven't had a chance to review it, but we will, uh, and uh, we can uh, certainly communicate our findings back to the board on that issue. That's okay. all I had. Okay, with that, Mr. Ford, um, I think. We're going to move on to Mr. Roncotti for now. Uh, Mr. Ford uh, can remain available if anybody has anything further for him. No, we're, we're going to first open it up to the public if there's no more comments from the dais. Okay, thank you. So may I have a motion to open to the public? So moved. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. And <laughs> if there's anyone in the public uh, that would like to... Uh, question any of the testimony provided by Mr. Ford this evening, please uh, raise your hand or if you're on the phone, press star nine to indicate you would like to uh, question Mr. Ford's. Yeah, going I, on. I see none, Mr. Chairman. Nope, so we will move on to the next witness. Thank Does you. Michael need a break? Uh, yeah, I was going to ask for just, uh, I guess, five minutes. Before you move on, please, Mr. Stewart has his hand raised now. Oh. Yes, he does. You're on mute, Mr. Stewart. You can unmute yourself, Mr. Stewart. How about now? There you go. Okay. Good evening. Um, my name is Richard Stewart. I'm from the law firm of Lasser Hockman. I am the attorney for Wheeland Hillsborough Associates, uh, which is the owner of Lot 3, where the Bottle King is located. And I did have uh, just one question for Mr. Ford. Um, Mr. Ford, I, I believe you indicated that uh, there would be no access or access would not be permitted from the Bottle King property onto the subject property. Is that correct? Yes. What about vehicles exiting the subject property over the Bank of America easement area? Will they be utilizing any portion of the Bottle King property? Uh, yes, they would. Just like the Bank of America actually goes to the Bottle King property, yes. Okay, thank you. No other questions. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Stewart. Okay, so we're ready to move on to the next. Oh no, we're going to take a break. Five minute recess. Uh, we, will, we will take a. Was it? Looks like it's nine oh seven. So we'll take an eight minute recess and reconvene at nine fifteen sharp. Okay, if everybody wants to just put your uh, turn your video off for the for the break. Thank you. Thank you.
Mike, you playing any hockey? No, none. And uh, I have a baby due in a month, not even oh. a few weeks. Ah. But, um, so uh, I've been reluctant to get back out there, but my, my teams have been playing. <laughs> so uh, Lapani, did you see the score? I have not. I'm keeping. I'm recording it. So hush up. <laughs> I, I won't say anything. <laughs> That's what, it's amazing. You can get through a, a hockey game in in 60 minutes when you have it on DVR, right? No, no commercials. No 20 minutes in between. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. It goes quick. And if you fall asleep, you can watch the rest of it later. There you go. So, Kurt, when when we have in the uh, inaugural uh, Hillsborough Township Planning Board hockey game on your, <laughs> it, it could be next week. I mean, it's going to be cold, and yeah, I think yeah. we have a meeting next week. Right, Kurt, do you do you have a rink? A, you could start a new tradition. Uh, instead of when we used to have our uh, mayor's trophy game, softball game against Montgomery, you guys can now do a hockey. Yeah. I'll be the puck because I can't skate. <laughs> Just not. Oh, I will. Um, I'll go to the hospital right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I reserve to drive the Zamboni. There you go. I'll, record, I'll yeah. record it from the side. There you go. We may have to we may have to recruit some people, but yeah, it looks awesome. Yeah, he uh, he showed me the picture. He built his own little field of dreams there with his his hockey rink. It requires Mother Nature to cooperate. Yes. He yeah, needed the ice. He needed the cold weather, finally. We do. Yeah. I like right, the little... 916. Uh, yeah. so, Michael, do you want to roll call just to make sure everybody's back? Yeah, absolutely. Um, All right. Mr. Emick? Here. Mr. Ciccarelli? Here. Mr. Scobo? Yes. Mr. Pizan? I am here. Deputy Mayor Delcor? Is not here. Mayor Lapani? Here. Vice Chair Julian? Here. Chair Sirachi? Here. Professionals. And Mr. Kinsler? Here. Mr. Maskey? Here. Mr. Euro? Here. And Mr. Hack? Here. Okay, okay so we're back uh, in session and we are <clears throat> bringing up the next witness, Counselor. Yes, sorry, that was one of my other questions. Um, all right, thank you and welcome back. Oh, we're gonna bring up Mr. Roncati now, who, there he is. Hi, Conrad, how are you? Good evening, everyone. Hi, Conrad, let me just swear you in, all right? Do you swear any testimony you give tonight is gonna be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. And for the record, could you state and spell your name, please? Sure, Conrad Roncati, R-O-N-C-A-T-I. I'm a licensed architect in the state of New Jersey. For over 30 years, my address is uh, One Executive Drive, Fort Lee, New Jersey. Thank you. So, Mr. Brancati, would you please uh, provide your experience and credentials to the board? Uh, certainly. I, I believe I was qualified uh, when we first began this uh, hearing on this application uh, a couple of years ago, but um, I'm a licensed architect in the state of New Jersey. I'm licensed in 17 other jurisdictions. I have NCARB certification. I'm registered in almost uh, every state up and down uh, the Eastern Seaboard, uh, as well as uh, Illinois, Michigan, Nevada, um, and other states. I've testified uh, at over a thousand planning and zoning board meetings in New Jersey alone in uh, nearly 200 different communities during my career. Mr. Chairman, I would submit Mr. Roncotti as an expert in the field of architecture. Okay, <clears throat> so anyone from the board? Any reservations? I see head shaking no, so we will accept Ms. <clears throat> Mr. Roncotti's qualifications and you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Conrad, I'm going to turn it over to you. Tell me which exhibits you want, and I'll walk through the. I'll make sure they're up as you walk through your testimony. Uh, certainly, I'll try to get uh, through this quickly uh, and thoroughly for the board. Um, we uh, are the architects. I am the architect for this project. As uh, was discussed by Mr. Ford, uh, this is a site that is a through site between uh, two major arteries, 206 and Amwell Road. Uh, it is narrow uh, in its width, but long in its depth. 
Um, we have read and understand uh, the town uh, center uh, district regulations, the zoning, and our planning of this project, we believe comports with the purpose and intent of those uh, rules, regulations, and recommendations. Uh, as Mr. Ford presented in his site plan, we are presenting two buildings, one that fronts on each road, but we are also uh, embellishing the site plan with landscaping and improvements and a clock tower uh, at the center of uh, the site uh, to uh, not only have uh, buildings that address the two streets, but also work and present well internally to pedestrians and visitors to the center. Uh, we also understand that these two buildings are seen in 360 degrees, all sides are visible. We really don't have uh, a rear side to any of these buildings. So we have worked hard to make sure that the architecture and the aesthetic of the building works um, on all four sides of each structure. Uh, the materials uh, in detailing are consistent on all four sides of both structures. Um, and they, they do, we believe, present well as standalone buildings, whether you're on 206, on Amwell Road, within the site, or on the properties adjacent uh, to us. Um, we have presented uh, exhibits which uh, uh, present the elevations of the buildings as well as the floor plans. We've also presented renderings, which I'd like to uh, discuss briefly here this evening. Uh, both buildings are the same uh, in theory and in scope. Um, if perhaps, uh, Council, if we could look at exhibits, exhibit A6, which is a three sheet architectural exhibit. Um, while you get those up, um, building one, uh, as we refer to it, is the building that's uh, adjacent to Route 206. First floor uh, is 3,305 square feet, second floor a little bit larger, 3,362 square feet. The slight difference in area has to do with uh, architectural detailing on the second floor, just the pushing and pulling of the design and the floor plate to make the exterior um, more interesting, afforded a couple of extra square feet upstairs on the second floor. The total is 6,667 square feet. Uh, if we could quickly go to the next sheet, A102, same exhibit. Uh, this is building two. The footprint is identical to the first building, 3,305 square feet. The second floor uh, is a little bit smaller in this building, 3,299, total 6,604. Again, the only difference in the second floor had to do with the push and pull of the floor plan, the box space, and some of the other detailing we did uh, to make each building um, aesthetically pleasing. Um, I would also point out that uh, both buildings are of similar design, similar size, uh, similar materials, but each one, each building is slightly different than the next. We're, we're not looking to create one building design and cookie cutter it twice. So we spent a lot of time uh, making manipulations to the design, the style of the windows, the use and placement of materials and the like um, to make sure that the buildings were recognized as uh, being a pair of buildings and being very similar, yet each having a slightly different um, aesthetic appeal. Uh, there are two and a half story structures, two floors, but a half story uh, with uh, the uh, roof. The exterior, again, as I mentioned, of the two buildings share the same uh, materials. Um, the uh, exterior materials include hardy lap siding, cultured stone, um, AZAC uh, composite trim, uh, which is most of the white trim details that you see. We have asphalt shingle, on the majority of the roofs, but to break up um, and create a little bit of accent, uh, mostly on the arcade, but um, also elsewhere, including the little uh, uh, cupolas at the top, 
We've introduced metal standing seam roof and a copper color. And then the columns um, are intended to be a composite uh, fiberglass. So they'll uh, resist rot and weather and water and will be durable at the arcade where we'll have people walking and strollers uh, and the like. Um, we've also, uh, I've also reviewed the architectural design overlay standards. Um, these are the materials. The materials that I just described are consistent uh, with the materials that are outlined um, and suggested uh, by that document. Um, there is also a third sheet in this exhibit. If I could uh, have you turn to that. Um, this is a still exhibit A06. This is the um, clock tower that's at the center of the property in between the two buildings. It's 12 feet by 12 feet in plan. Uh, there's a, a walkway through it and under it. So it's occupiable uh, in a way, which we think is fun. And our pedestrian path uh, will take you through and under this uh, clock tower. Uh, if you will note, the materials again are very similar to what we find on the two buildings. So there's a relationship between the, the three structures, the cultured stone, the Azac trim, and then the copper metal uh, at the top, uh, the cupola. And I will come back to this uh, exhibit in a moment. If we could please council return to A101. Um, and just the, let me interrupt you just one second, Mr. Sure. Rungati. I just wanna let the board members know, I can zoom in and zoom out as you deem fit. So if anybody would like me to zoom in, please just indicate that and I can do that for you. Thank you, Ms. Holden. So I would like to um, discuss the standards um, of the architectural and site design overlay zone. Uh, there are a series of standards, um, including roofs and roof materials, entrances and windows, facade treatment and facade materials. I just referenced this. Um, as well as arcades, awnings, and porches. Um, I could go through each of these, but we comply um, with an, the overwhelming number of items we, we comply with, with this design. Uh, and I mentioned some of that in my descriptions of, of the buildings, the roof slope, roof materials, and the use of materials. With the board's permission, I would like to just quickly focus on uh, the three um, areas um, that we uh, need to address where we're requesting uh, a waiver. Um, perhaps, uh, Council, we could zoom in on the um, elevation three on this sheet. So the first waiver uh, that I would like to uh, uh, address is, um, the uh, window heights um, must be positioned on the first floor, our retail window heights. Um, your ordinance suggests that these windows be positioned 26 to 36 inches off the ground. Um, we are proposing 20 inches. So our window sill on our display windows into our retail space, we're proposing at 20 inches, your ordinance suggests a range of 26 to 36. Um, we believe that the design of these windows, the size of them, the proportion of them um, are, are commensurate with the building design. We also like the idea that uh, these windows are a little bit lower as we're talking about retail uh, space. And we also have these porches that we've put on the uh, building facades and covered the arcades. Um, and those screen to a certain degree, those retail display windows. And we would um, ask that the board consider our request for a waiver uh, allowing our window sill height to be just six inches below um, your minimum uh, recommended uh, window sill height. Um, there is also um, uh, a, a requirement in your ordinance that arcades be at least eight feet wide. Perhaps, Council, we could 
go to the top of this plan, detail one. So we have um, on both buildings and they're similar, we have arcades that are on the front of the building. In each case, front of the building, I'm referring to the uh, 206 elevation or the Amwell Road elevation. We've added these porches on the front of the building. And then those porches or arcades return heading into the site along the long uh, facade of the building perpendicular to each of those roads. Um, as uh, your ordinance says, eight feet wide, we have that on the front of each building, again, parallel to each of the roadways. But when we return into the site, our arcades are five feet, six inches. So we're two and a half feet less than the minimum um, suggested by um, the ordinance. Um, as Mr. Ford mentioned uh, during his testimony, and I, I mentioned in the beginning of mine, we have a very narrow site. And after we take into consideration the width of the building, building setback, parking aisles, um, as well as head-in parking into these buildings, um, we don't have a lot of room. Uh, we think that the uh, request for a 5.6 arcade is sufficient. We think it's certainly commensurate with the design. Um, and a 5.6 would allow uh, pedestrians to pass each other comfortably. It would allow strollers to pass walkers, two strollers um, to go side by side. Um, and we don't think that there will be an issue in these two areas where we get down to five foot six. And again, remind the board that the larger uh, arcades are, uh, along the roadways are uh, in excess of eight feet. Uh, there's also a little bit more to discuss uh, with respect to these arcades. Uh, Council, if we could look at, if you could scroll down a little bit to um, elevation number five, please. So elevation five uh, depicts the elevation along uh, route 206. Um, when we first presented this concept and the design to the board, uh, we had a porch uh, arcade on the front of the building, but it did not extend past the building to the right in this elevation, which is to the north of the building. And we have since added this extension of these arcades, these porticos, perhaps it could be described as uh, gazebo-like structures on the building. And the purpose of this um, was to create more of a facade along 206, create more impact, the appearance of a wider building. We can't make our buildings wider due to site plan use and site plan design uh, and limitations, but we took advantage of the parking beyond these gazebo spaces to widen the building, increase the appearance of the building along the street, and I think start to establish more of a, a streetscape as was uh, the purpose and intent of your uh, architectural design overlay standards. And what I've described here on building one is the same for building two along Amwell Road. Council, maybe you could look at detail five for us on the second sheet. So again, you'll see in this uh, elevation five, bottom left corner here. Thank you. Um, again, this uh, narrower elevation of the building is now increased, and this is a dimension on both of 20 feet. So this building goes from 44 feet in width at the body to 64 feet um, in width um, with the extension and with the uh, gazebo. So we think it was a successful solution we also have some renderings um, that we can uh, present, which show this all three-dimensionally, and I think it's um, compelling. So we have um, two exhibits, exhibit seven um, and exhibit eight. Uh, Council, this is not the correct um, exhibit. Yes. Yeah, so that is the one that was submitted to the board as AO7 um, before 
I received the one from you. So this is the, uh, I think the older one that was previously submitted to the board and that's the one we ended up marking. Okay. And I apologize for that because I'm a little late into the game on the application. Um, this one had a little bit of a clearer image, but it's not the one, it's not the most recent one I have. Is it possible for me, I, I don't have it to share on my screen, but I could hold it up to my camera or is it too late for a new exhibit? I defer to the board on that. They have a pre-submission um, requirement that they request we comply with. I, if I, if I stop share, if I continue to share my screen, I might be able to go find it. <coughs> yeah, <clears throat> Brian, can you uh, provide some guidance? I believe we have to have everything submitted. Yeah, no, uh, um, I think uh, if the board is uh, inclined to do so, I think. Uh, it would be helpful to have the more recent exhibit. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think it should be presented uh, if that is uh, what the applicant is proposing in terms of the architectural design, we should see what it's going to be. All right. I mean, is it material difference? Uh, is there a material difference between the two? So if I, if I may, Mr. Chairman, um, the, the, uh, the building is exactly the same. It's simply the new uh, arcade and porch replacing that more modern uh, image that we just saw. If I held it up, would that help the board in determining whether or not? Uh, I, I, know it, I know it's rudimentary, but I could do that. Carl, well, we, I think we could look at it and, and, and just as, as a, just as a to show it, and then it could be submitted for, for later. I think I understand what it's what it's supposed to be. Can we mark this as a new exhibit then? Yeah, why don't we mark it as a new exhibit? I was going to say. Do we want to just call it B1 just to keep it simple? Yeah. Well, we, we were up to A10, so if you just want to call it A11, okay. I, I would prefer, yeah, that, that would keep no, it clean. Fine. And then I, while you're doing that, so that you don't have to just look at what Mr. Rancati has, is, I'm now forcing him to hold up to the screen. I'm going to try to locate it. Um, so that I can show it to you with share screen while he's going through it. Yes, thank you, Ms. Walters. Yeah. Erwin, can you email this to her PDF, please? Sure. Yeah, it's, We're going to send it over to you, Shelly. Yeah, I have, it's not, it's, <laughs> unfortunately, it's not that easy because I'm not actually showing it to you from my work computer. So when you email it to my work, I'm not going to be able to share it here at home. I, I have a, another method, but I, I can take care of it. It won't be. Well, um, if I may, with my rudimentary screen sharing, um, you'll notice that uh, the porch and the arcade in this area has been extended. Excuse so me, Mr. Rancati, this is this Fred Kinsel. Let me see if I spotlight your video, if that will help for everybody. Just give me one second. Okay. Does that help everybody? Helps me. Yeah, that works. Okay, yeah. go ahead, Mr. Roncotti. You can see, we can see it better now. So this portion here is consistent with what we presented before. This portion is the gazebo area that I was describing that was added to the building, extending this facade by 20 feet in appearance. And it also creates a nice entry point for the arcade. So when you come off Route 206 or Amwell, you're into a nice uh, gazebo area in the arcade and either advance parallel to the road or perpendicular to the road heading back into the site. Okay. Any questions from the board? Comments? I have one question, Chairman, uh, as far as any lighting underneath those gazebos and, or arcades, as you call it, are they going to be used especially, I guess, for outside dining for if there's a restaurant there for outside use? Is it adequate lighting or would that? It would be adequate lighting for that use, yes. Okay. And LED lighting. Um, Council, does my second rendering exhibit it is the, it is what you sent me. It was an oversight. It was not an oversight. It was a misunderstanding on our on my part. Only but because I, my second rendering also depicts this 
extension area, and if it's the correct one, um, it shows the image of that extension in gazebo piece, not from the road, but from internal um, looking back out. All right, I have it all up now. So I'll submit this to the board marked A11. Um, I'll submit electronic and paper copies. This was the perspective that you just were going over. Correct, Mr. Roncotti? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. And then this is the second perspective that you were just going to talk about. Right, so this perspective um, is uh, looking um, eastward towards Route 206 uh, from the center of the property. And you'll notice the arcade along the north wall of the building. And you also notice the extension of that front arcade and gazebo piece out to the left uh, side of the building in this picture. And that, I think, um, does a couple of things. It extends the facade, creates more of the streetscape along both roadways. I think it creates a pleasant entry point uh, for the project and an arrival point. And in a way, it also acts um, to screen some of the parking in this, these two particular areas from both roadways. So I think it, ser it serves multiple uh, benefits. Also here in these renderings, maybe a little bit more clearly, the board will see um, the windows that we're proposing at, at uh, 20 inches um, being a little bit less than the recommendations under your standards and guidelines. But again, would submit with the transom, with the height of the window and the architecture and aesthetics of the building, it proportionately uh, works very well. Um, in my opinion. Mr. Roncati, uh, being <clears throat> one other question I didn't notice in your plans, again, being in, in our TC center, are there any facilities for bicycles to rack or, or park? Um, I would defer back to uh, Mr. Ford okay. on that. I'm sorry, sir. Okay. Um, if, if, if I may, uh, there was one other um, item relating to the arcade um, in your, um, in your uh, uh, ordinance, um, section F.2, um, there is a, also a requirement for a maximum height of eight feet within the arcade. We're proposing to be a little bit taller than that at nine feet, six inches. Um, but again, Given the style, given the, the uh, organization of this, given the aesthetics of this building, and the fact that we're not a strip mall with a very, very long arcade, we feel that having that additional height is going to be important. These renderings are accurate with respect to scale. Um, and we would request uh, also a waiver for a nine foot six arcade ceiling. Um, exceeding the eight foot uh, permitted height. All right, thank you, Mr. Runcotti. So earlier, uh, somebody, I believe it was Mr. Maskey, asked us about whether or not we are complying with the green technology requirements of the ordinance. Can you address that, please? Yes, yeah, so there's a, a green technology um, uh, requirement in your ordinance. Uh, we will have a lead accredited professional involved uh, with the project uh, from the office, from staff. Uh, we will provide proof uh, that we meet minimum lead standards. This project um, will be designed to, and we have already made early determinations. We have no problem meeting the minimum lead standards. However, uh, we would like to point out to the board that we may not formally apply for lead certification um, with the U.S. Green Building Council. So while we will comply with the spirit of the rule, we will meet minimum lead standards. Uh, we may not actually make that application for formal lead certification. Mr. Yeah, Ryan, that, 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 that is the intent of the ordinance. It's, um, we don't expect you necessarily to apply, but uh, the planning department will will review your uh, your lead uh, documentation and 
that's as far as you need to go. Fantastic, thank you. And uh, with the board's permission, my next uh, topic is signage to cover. Mr. Roncardi, I have a question. This is Mr. Emick, and yes, maybe you'll talk about it as a part of that clock tower. Um, first, I commend you on the architecturals. They are visually interesting. I mean, a Thank lot you. of detail has gone into them and uh, I think they're visually pleasing. Thank and um, so I, I commend you on that. Um, as I look at the clock tower, is is the per what's the purpose of the clock tower? Is it more of a sign or is it supposed to be a beacon? Like uh, I see that there's a, a clock on it. I think the clock faces, the clock face faces both 206 and Amwell Road to the, um, I'm trying to think the east and the west, maybe facing the ShopRite and the Petrox. Is yeah, so the, the clocks actually face north and south. So if you're coming down Route 206. You'll see that clock. Okay. Okay. And, and to be candid, your 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 question was it more beacon? Was it more sign? We did attempt to create a balance um, between something that created a recognizable um, uh, icon, oh, yeah. did provide for signage, um, but we also felt very strongly that we really needed to create a center to this site plan. And we didn't wanna look like a building along 206 and a building along uh, Amwell. We wanted to create a site that internalized in and of itself and felt that this clock tower, in addition to being a beacon, a clock, a town center type of element, and yes, providing signage, kind of did that also. It created Super. an in interesting element yeah. for, for uh, pedestrians also. Yeah, no, I think you did a, a nice job at it. And uh, I, again, I can, I can see the vision. How do you plan on illuminating that? Uh, in other words, it, it could be really cool coming down 206 to see it. Is the clock face itself illuminated, like behind? And then are you going to do like lighting, like ground lit? Or is there lighting on it to help illuminate it softly so that you can see it? I, I again, to be candid, I didn't um, think about the clock face being illuminated. But now that you're suggesting that, well, not suggesting that, but asking, <laughs> um, it certainly sounds like that might be a good idea. I don't think it's our intention to brightly light this, but I think some accent on it would certainly be beneficial and it should glow, not project light in any way. Yeah. Again, I'm not sure how my peers, you know, on the board feel about it, but. Again, I could see how it could be just very striking and visually interesting. I'd hate to see that it's dark. In other words, that it doesn't have any, you know, kind of balance or any presence on the site. Um, so I, I think there are some opportunities there. Thank you. Yeah, I, I also, I, I agree with, uh, with what Kurt said. Uh, Mr. Rancati, uh, two questions. One, uh, does the size of the windows impact the lead certification? So you're asking for a waiver or uh, 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 on on the size of the window where the sill is going to be, and I'm just want to I'm wondering if that affects the lead certification. I I don't think it'll affect the lead certification. We have a significant amount of wall surface area left in these buildings, so. If we're running our energy calculations or we're looking at lead, I don't believe that we're going to run afoul of those uh, requirements on a on a calculation basis for like loss heat and heat uh, loss. Well, I was factor. thinking more. I was thinking more of natural light in. You know, I, I know there's a lot of variables that go into lead certification. So I just I'm just in, asking that question. Good question. Uh, I, oh, I didn't pick up on the. Uh, I, my mind went right to the energy side. Uh, that's a very good point. Um, again, candidly, I, I don't think that that was a consideration. It was more of an aesthetic and a, and a desire to make display windows as large as possible without making it look like fully glass uh, first floor, like a traditional strip mall might have with 
just a band of windows. Okay, thanks. And uh, on the rendering, I, I know, th th and this might not be your purview, but I want to bring the, the issue up is there was a discussion about this, the length of the, or the depth of the parking spots and that there could be a two foot overhang. Well, if one, based on what I see for the arcade there, there's, you know, you're going to hit a post or you're going to encroach on the curb. Uh, and so the question is on these parking spots, is there going to be a, a concrete bollard on the ground uh, to prevent cars from, you know, entering the store? I, per se. I, I, I just quickly glanced over my shoulder at Mr. Ford's site plan. It looks like our columns are at least two feet behind the curb. In reality, I think our rendering depicts them a little bit closer than they're actually being placed in reality. I think your question still remains, somebody could hit a column um, and you know, perhaps um, parking uh, stops uh, should be added uh, to the plan in these areas, just so that there's a, you know, a curb stop. Thank you. It looks good. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Roncati, thank you for going through all that. Now, I believe your office prepared um, a sign schedule, and uh, we did ex we did submit that as an exhibit. And I know your rent your architectural elevations also demonstrate where the proposed signage would be on each of the uh, buildings and the clock tower. Would you like to run through those? Yes. Could we please? Could you please return to Exhibit A06 then? Yes, sir. Thank you. So um, there are, again, the buildings are nearly identical. So when I talk about building one, um, by default, with many of the things I'm saying, I'm speaking about building two. And uh, with the board's permission, I don't want to bore the board by going through the same thing for both buildings. But suffice to say that there are two types of signs on the building. Uh, there are signs that are on the sign band, which is immediately above the columns and below the copper uh, roof, for example, in this elevation. Uh, on building one, there are four of these signs, three on the right side or parking lot elevation and down below in elevation five, right below that, that's facing route 206, we have one sign of this size. Each of these four signs is 36 um, square feet. We have these same signs on the building number two. And I would point out that uh, this is a variance request. In your ordinance, you ask for a maximum of 20 square feet um, per sign. So these four signs on this building and six signs on building two, which I'll show you in a moment, um, are 36 feet and exceed that um, 20 square foot threshold. Um, I would submit to the board that these signs are um, well proportioned. We feel that they're in keeping with the architecture of the building. We feel that they are of a size um, um, that will allow them to be visible and present to each of the tenants. Um, and that um, they were carefully considered to be integrated with the architecture. So they're not slapped on a larger field of wall. Um, they're integrated. They're as tall as the sign band. So they're neatly kind of organized uh, on the facade. These are um, metal aluminum box um, signs. They are LED. They are um, raised channel letters, each of the signs, um, internally illuminated um, channel letters, as well as backlit, very softly backlit. So these are very good quality signs. Uh, and when we talk about these signage um, sizes, we're not talking about rear illuminated box signs. So we're not looking at a, a three foot high by 12 foot wide white internally illuminated sign. We're looking at a 36 square foot panel area with then channel letters on it. So the actual signs themselves will be far less than 
36 square feet, but logos sometimes are tall and round or square, and then the letters next to them small. So we're trying to afford ourselves um, the sign box area that we need. And those sign boxes are integrated into the architecture of the building on this um, sign band. Um, I would also like to point out that in our exhibit here, um, up at if Council, if we could just scroll up to the floor plans. In each of these buildings, as I mentioned, we're only 3,300 square feet approximately on the ground floor, and that includes the elevator lobby. Um, we are anticipating potentially three retail spaces in each building. That would be the maximum. Um, more than likely, we will not end up with three retailers per building. We could end up with two, possibly one, in which case there is a direct impact on the number of signs that would actually be placed on the building. But we're trying to uh, allow our clients and marketing people the ability to have flexibility. So we're asking for um, the number of signs uh, that you see before you uh, this evening. There are also on this building, Council, we can go back to elevations three, four, and five. You'll notice up in the gable ends on these three elevations above the second story in the roof, we're proposing um, six um, signs. These are 15 square feet each. So they comply with your um, signage, max signage requirement. Um, however, in your ordinance, uh, we require a variance uh, because these signs are, as your ordinance states, above second story window sills. So these signs are certainly above the window sill. They're actually above the windows entirely on the second floor. But in these three gable ends, uh, again, we feel that uh, they're neatly tucked in. And again, this goes to visibility. Um, and allowing uh, the tenants to have um, exposure. Um, if we could just quickly council go to building two elevations. And again, similar concept, similar uh, uh, information. I won't go through all the details again. Everything remains the same on this building with respect to the type of signage, location, integration in the sign band. Here we have the same six signs above the second floor windowsill at 15 square feet complying with uh, the size requirement, max size requirement. But we also, again, are requesting six signs at 36 square feet, again, exceeding the 20 square feet. Uh, there's also a provision in your ordinance that I'd like to point out that signs cannot exceed 10% of the facade area and I would like to point out to the board, because I think it's important in your consideration of our requests here, that on any given facade with signage, the total aggregate signage represents 1.8% of the total facade area at a minimum and up to 5.2% at a maximum. So, of all of these six facades that we just looked at, the worst case scenario is 5.2%, which is uh, half of the maximum allowed under your ordinance. So we feel that we're certainly respecting that particular uh, component of your, of your ordinance. Um, with the board's permission, I would move on to the clock tower. We could certainly come back to this. But in the clock tower, which is still exhibit A06, um, we have the four elevations of the clock tower here. As I uh, mentioned earlier in response to a board member's question, there are two signs which don't have signage, two sides that do facing east and west, generally to the two roadways. We have five signs on each of these um, facades. Again, recognizing the fact that um, we could have up to 10 tenants here. That would be max three retail and max two commercial tenants 
on the second floor. I don't think I mentioned that earlier. Five tenants, therefore, per building, five um, and five being 10. But then again, it could be a single tenant, retail tenant, and a single commercial tenant. And we could end up with a total of uh, possibly four, only four tenants on the entire property. Um, the five signs on each side of the clock tower um, add up to 10.4 square feet. Um, they're each one foot eight inches by six feet wide, each of the five signs. Uh, there are also two uh, monument signs. Um, the monument sign um, drawing itself was prepared by uh, Bardish Signs. Um, it wasn't my exhibit, um, but the sign portion um, of, the, of the monument sign, and there's one on 206 and, and one on Amwell Road, the signage dimensions, which is uh, sign A on Route 206, is seven feet by nine feet. Again, that has uh, a potential of 10 slots or 10 tenants. And um, sign B on Amwell <coughs> Road is a little bit lower but wider at six by 12. Um, and again, has the, uh, the 10, 10 potential tenant side spaces uh, available on. So, so if I get this correct, so there would be two signs for each tenant, one on the monument, one on the tower or clock tower. Is that it the would be yes, it would be one on the clock tower, certainly, and then one on the building. Yes. Okay. What about the monument sign? And the monument sign. Yes. So that's three. That would, that be, would be one on each. Each tenant would be represented on each of those features, one on each monument sign on the clock tower and on that we each have a sign on the buildings. So uh, it, it, Mr. Chairman, I think you asked the question, it could be four locations, right? Two monument, one clock tower and one building mounted sign. Right, I mean, the, the building would go with that same. So because what I recall- course, we have an unusual circumstance where we have two roadway frontages. So I think right. we have to take that and certainly the board uh, I hope would take that into consideration. It might be more than normal, but we do have two road frontages and two separate uh, ingress egress points. We, we also have um, a sign, uh, our sign contractor slash expert with us and um, who will provide testimony to explain that as well. Um, and you'll get some testimony from Mr. Dean regarding the monument signage as well. Uh, Mr. Sure. Chairman, if I, if I may. Oh, David. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, we just got the sign package to us a couple of days ago, so we didn't really have much opportunity to get into a really thorough review. But from what the best we could tell, there's 22 facade signs for eight to 10 tenants. There are two monument signs, each with space for 10 signs. Then we have the clock tower, which has 10 signs on it, 84 square feet on either side. We have a number of signs that are 36 square feet, which exceed the 20 square feet permitted. Um, I haven't heard any testimony about why all these signs are required. It's an awful lot of signage for a small, Again, small site. That's gonna come from the next two witnesses. Okay, these are variances, you realize that. I do, and we have a planner for that as well. Um, but I, I just, Mr. Rancotti was running through uh, the what signs are proposed and where they're proposed. Uh, okay. Mr. Crawford will give you detail about why um, and more detail about the uh, materials and lighting for the signs. Mr. Dean will talk to you a little bit more about the need for the tenant signage on the monument signs. Uh, um, keep in mind we that we sign. have other developments very close by to this that didn't need any sign variances. Understood. Right. And, and, and near just, this much signage. Yeah, and I just want to add, because if I recall the last time, I think there, there were some reservations from the board about the tower signage in general. 
Yeah, keep in mind that freestanding signs aren't permitted at all, and you have three of them. We know. Yeah, we're, we're going to give you all the testimony, and we can talk about the signage on the clock tower. Um, and you know, as we move after we move through the balance of the sign testimony, I, I'd like to come back and revisit those questions at that point. Okay. Council, I, I, uh, I had a checklist and an outline. I think I've covered everything that you wanted me uh, to present. If I missed anything, I'm happy to revert to something. But The only thing I, I'd like to just kind of let the, you know, clarify, I'm going to put A6 back up on the screen for just a moment. Uh, with respect to your second, the second floor floor plan for the two buildings, we're currently, uh, as submitted, it was shown as a single office space. Uh, you made reference to it, but I, I just want to make it clear for the board. Uh, we're reserving the potential for that to actually uh, fit two office tenants. Is right. that correct? I, I, yes, and I, I think it's possible um, that it could be subdivided into two. I don't see it being subdivided further. I, it, just given its size, and the way we've organized with one stair and elevator, um, I, I don't see three tenancies being possible. So it's, so, it's one or two. So the proposal would be no more than two? Yes. Okay. Is the floor plan only showed the one I wanted to make sure the board understood yes, that we contemplated a second tenant there? Yeah. Um, all right. And then I believe. Uh, count, counselor, can I ask a question on if you're going to divide that lower? Section, do you need to provide a, another emergency access out the back for the subdivision? Because right now I only see uh, doors, looks like just in the front. Is there anything in the back for emergency exit? Are we talking about the, uh, Mr. Chairman, the first floor or the second? I guess the, the, I just, the, the first floor, which you're talking about possibly subdividing or the uh, second? The sec we were referring to the office on the second floor. On the second floor. Um, okay. There, there, there's actually no, at this size, we wouldn't need two means of egress out of the second floor. Okay. And, and the first floor elevations, they do show rear exit doors, do they not, Mr. Runcock? Yes, that, that, again, those are not required by fire code because we're less than 75 feet, but they would be for um, tenant access. Delivery, not, you know, coming in the back into an office, for example. In a retail space. All right. Uh, thank you. I, I have no further questions for um, Mr. Runcotti. Okay. So <clears throat> I gotta shrink this. So if if there's an, any more questions from the uh, from the board, I will uh, go out to the uh, public. If anyone would like to ask questions on the testimony of this witness. Please raise your virtual hand or press star nine if, you're, uh, if you've dialed in via phone. I see none, Chairman. No, I agree. So we may, okay. I'm just, I'm just checking the time right now. So I think we can move on to your next witness. Thank you. My next, uh, my next witness will be Mr. Richard Crawford. Mr. Crawford, can you hear us? Yes. Thank you. Uh, good Hi, evening. Mr. Crawford. I just want to swear you in, all right? Yes. Do you swear any testimony you get tonight is going to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. And for the record, could you state and spell your name, please? Richard Crawford, C-R-A-W-F-O-R-D. Thanks. Good evening, Mr. Crawford. Um, would you please explain to the board your experience with the design and installation of signage? Sure. Um, I wear several different hats. I appreciate the board's indulgence. Um, I've been working in the sign industry since 1983. I work with Bar 2 Signs located in Oregsburg, Pennsylvania. It's near Pottsville. I'm a project manager and designer. Uh, I have a consulting firm, Mercer Sign Consultants, where I help clients with problems with sign zoning. Um, I'm a licensed attorney in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And I've served on the board of directors of a national foundation, the United States Sign Council Foundation. Um, it's a 5013C. We do research on signs, uh, research on sign size, sign height, sign lighting, that sort of thing. Uh, most of the research has been done at the Transportation Institute at Penn State. And I've directed 
about 20 or 22 studies so far. Have you provided testimony before uh, land use boards in the state of New Jersey before this evening? Yes, multiple times. I think the last time I was in Hillsborough it was 15 years ago at least. All right. Um, Mr. Chairman, with Mr. Crawford's background with signage, I would submit him as an expert in, in signs. I uh, would ask the board consider him as such. I defer to the board. <clears throat> any reservations by any of the board members? Okay, I see some head shakes now, so you may proceed, we accept. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Crawford, you are, have you been involved in the, um, or will you be involved in the development of the signs for this site? Yes. All right, and I'm going to defer to you to explain, please to explain to the board the sign materials and the lighting for each type of sign that's being proposed. Sure, well, first, whatever we show, it may have the wrong center name. The center name is Town Square. Uh, I, I may have the wrong names on some of them. For instance, the, the freestanding signs. Uh, could you put up uh, A10, the sign exhibit? Yes, sir. So I'm going to go through the signs. The tenant signs on the buildings, first and second floor, the clock tower signs, and then the monument signs. This is a um, <clears throat> design that I generated showing the signs for the first floor tenants. Uh, they will be, they will have internally illuminated channel letters. They will be both front lit and back lit. Uh, they'll be four inch deep letters. The signs will be consistent for all the first floor tenants. Uh, there'll be low voltage LED lighting and they'll be compliant with the township uh, lighting rules. Uh, you see a three foot by 12 foot staging panel. That's a fabricated aluminum panel. It's smooth, it's white, that has a two inch molding put on it. So it looks like it's part of the architecture of the building. The panel holds the wiring and the LED power supplies. Uh, the reason the panels are used, one, it's aesthetic. And secondly, it makes changing tenant names and changing tenant signs much more practical we're not making a lot of holes in, in the facade. The panel just comes off and a new panel gets put back on. Um, could you go to page three of this exhibit? We did a project like this with the applicant in Windsor Township, uh, in West Windsor Township called Windsor Plaza. And these are examples of the style of sign that we're, we're proposing here. Um, it's an elegant look light comes out the front of the letters, but light also, white light washes back out the, the back of the letters. Um, it's sort of subtle, but it has a really nice look at night. Uh, one note about the signs, and I don't want to put um, too fine a point on it, but we're asking for a three foot by 12 foot sign. But in reality, I can guarantee to the board, no sign is going to be 36 square feet. It, it's it, virtually impossible. Um, we did about 26 of these signs in West Windsor. I did a, an analysis of 10 of them. And when I went through them, the, the sign area of the channel letters ran from 12 square feet to 22 square feet. So all the letters, the actual sign has to fit within the staging panel. We could just take the staging panel off the wall. It'd have a flat wall and you'd have channel letters. Uh, but we think this is uh, more aesthetically pleasing and it has a, a practical aspect as well. Uh, the reason why we're looking for 36 square feet, if you will, or 22 square feet, um, is these signs and the tenant names really won't be visible from either road. It's, in my opinion, you might be able to spy them, but they won't be visible. So we're trying to make these um, as pleasing as possible for customers coming into the shopping center. And um, as the architect said, it fits within the proportion of the design of the building itself. Um, the signs for the second floor will be slightly different. Built the same. Uh, can we go to page four? Yeah, here we go. They're smaller. They're one, one foot six by 10. These signs will not have raised channel letters. They will have what we call routed out faces and push through lettering. The reason why they won't have channel letters is because when you get down to size of this, signs of this size, you can't make channel letters that small. Um, I think they'll look complimentary. When you look at the building, you won't say, 
oh, there's one different type of sign versus another type of sign. Um, but this is the way we can accomplish a high-end look, but also stay within the sign area. Uh, could we go to A6? Although we've been over this, could we go to A6? A6. Yeah. Here you go. Right. I know we've already been over this, but I guess this is the Route 206 uh, building, building one across the front, what I call the front. You have the three foot by 12 foot staging panels. And then you have the two smaller signs up top. On the end of the building facing the clock tower, which says rear elevation, you have two signs for the second floor tenants. That's done because the door is there and we want drivers, pedestrians to have a clue that's where they're supposed to go. On the opposite end, on the side facing 206, you have two small second floor tenant signs and you have one down below the three by 12 for the corner tenant. And then on the left side or what I call the rear elevation, there, there are no signs. Uh, building two is essentially the same. If we could go to it with one exception, and that is on the facade parallel or facing Amwell Road, there are three signs on the first level. One main three by 12, and then two 30 inch by six foot signs. They'll have the channel letters. Again, signs up top on the rear or side elevation facing the clock cap tower, and there's nothing on the back. So that, that is a, a brief description of the signage on the building. Um, we're not trying to make an excessive request. And when I did the analysis of this actual sign area, I think it's a reasonable request. You could say 36 square foot staging panels, sign area not to exceed 22 square feet. Uh, we could certainly work with that because I know it will not actually because of the moldings and the space you have to have inside. But the staging panel, displays the, the, uh, the messages in an attractive way. That's why we're asking for it. So that's the tenant signage. I don't know the, um, oh, A8, the, uh, the tower clock rendering. Can we go to that? There you go. So the, I think we've already discussed there's signage on both sides of the clock tower. The reason why they're signage on the clock tower after discussions with the applicant is when a driver comes in from Anwell Road, he or she will see the names of the tenants in the other building and vice versa. These signs will really not be visible from the roadway. They're more for internal use. Um, they're so far, the, um, the distance from the road makes it almost impossible for a driver to see and read them. Um, they're identical on both sides and they'll, they'll have the tenants of the other building on, on both. Uh, the panels will be internally illuminated, um, LED lighting, routed out faces, so not plastic faces, and the lighting will be compliant with the township rules for sign lighting. So that, that's, that was the rationale for the clock tower. For the clock tower signage? Yeah, for the clock tower signage. Okay. And then to the monument signs, which I guess is still A10. Is that contained in there? That is contained in there. Yeah, okay. So the board will say there's two different designs. Uh, I took the sizes off the site plants. One was seven foot by nine foot. That's the one for 206. One is six, the other is six by 12. One is more squarish, one is more rectangular. Uh, they could match. Uh, we're just showing the two different options. Uh, these signs would be internally illuminated. Uh, they would have a fabricated aluminum cabinet, would have LED lighting, would be complying with township lighting rules, and it has a decorative copper roof with the standing seam detail. It'd be a painted copper patina, so we're trying to tie into the building. And then as a small stone base, I couldn't get an image of the stone from the, for the building, but we're gonna use stone that's used in the building for the base. 
Again, it should say town square. And the two sizes, I, I can't tell you which is better. It, it could be the board's preference, to tell you the truth. Um, both, both signs give us adequate size to have a readable listing for a driver on Amwell Road or 206. Um, the posted speed on 206, I believe, is 40 miles an hour. The posted speed on Amwell Road is 45. Um, the question is, why do, you, why do you have the listings? Uh, because the building, the tenant signs in the buildings aren't visible from 206 or Amwell Road, it's vital that you have the listings on the tenant directory, in my opinion. Um, and businesses want their names listed. Um, the board may question that, uh, the owner may wonder about, I may not agree with it, but I can tell you from having dealt with tenants for all these years, they find it vitally important to have their name on a freestanding sign along the roadway. And I know tenants don't spend their money unwisely. It, it is very important to them. And that's why we've included it here. Um, and we've sized the signs to provide the minimum area necessary to have a visible and legible listing. So we can get four inch to six inch letters on this sign for the listings. And if you reduce the size, you're basically reducing the, the visibility and the legibility. And I'd suggest that may not be, um, may be counterproductive, um, but that's the why, because it's really important to tenants and it's important for the success of the center to have the identification, identification out on the roadway, because otherwise you can't see into the center. It's not like a strip mall or a strip center that's parallel to the roadway. And that is, that is it in a nutshell. I'd be glad to answer any questions about the design or the sizes. Um, uh, Mr. Crawford, I'm just gonna scroll down for the record. I'm just scrolling down on the last page, yeah. exhibit 10, just to give the, the board the visual of the other alternative for the monument sign. Right. This, this one I'm showing is page six. This is the shorter but wider version. Yes, so this, this is the six by 12. It's eight foot four to the top. The other one is taller. It's nine foot four to the top. Um, if I had to pick one, <laughs> I'd probably pick the smaller one, the seven by nine, because it's not as wide. It doesn't have as wide a footprint. And so it, it doesn't make the driver, even though it's only a difference of three feet, it doesn't make the driver look in an extra three feet to read the sign. I have some questions or comments. Um, so you have, or at least you're proposing freestanding sign, directory sign on each street, fine. You pull in, you've got a 42 foot high tower with 84 square feet of signage. And then you have 36 square foot signs on every, on every storefront. Why so much signage? So I don't get it. When the application was initially put together, um, the, clock, the clock tower, and Mr. Seisner can weigh in on this because you know, obviously I'm just telling you what the information I have, and I'm kind of scrolling through here to get back to the right image. Um, the clock tower was anticipated for the signage, but with the report from Mr. Maskey um, and the comments from the board, we, I believe Mr. Seisner would be willing to eliminate the signage on the clock tower. Um, and that would leave the two freestanding signs, the two monument signs, which are vitally important to the success of the project and the proposed signage on the building. Uh, but I, I would- just, Yeah, go ahead, sorry. I was just gonna say, I would ask Mr. Seisner to weigh in on that at some point. Yeah, and then the size of the sign, I mean, the signs that are facing, these are relatively small parking fields. It's not a, a supermarket parking lot where you have to look several hundred feet to see the sign. You pull into one of these parking lots, the sign's right in front of your face. You're right, you can't see them from the road, but you can see them from the parking lot. Why do you need a 36 square foot sign when you're parked right in front of the sign? Well, like Mr. Crawford said, the sign itself is not actually 36 square feet. That's the panel. The raised channel letters that'll be on that panel will be smaller in, in nature, not probably in his estimation, no larger than 22 square feet. And if we go back to the image from exhibit A10, it shows you the commensurate signs this is what we're talking about. Uh, Mr. 
Crawford, if you want to walk through the panel and the uh, the raised elements, I can out outline them on the. Right. Yeah, no, no, I understood his description of it, but I think you have to clarify what size sign you're talking about. Not well, either it's 36 square feet or it's not, or if you're just measuring the actual dimension and closing the lettering, for instance, that's a different dimension. Well, uh, if, if, if I could offer, it, it may not have been presented as elegantly as it should have been or correctly. Um, because when you talk about three by 12, you start thinking that's the size of the sign. Uh, we're really asking for code compliant signage, but we wanna mount it on a staging panel. And in a lot of townships, once you say staging panel, they start counting the whole staging panel. But the sign area itself, yeah. for instance, US Nails, I think that was, a, that was like 19.97 square feet. Yeah. So you're, you're limited so by the, the height and the width yeah. in any event. So it sounds like what we may need is maybe a uh, an outline within that panel saying where, you know, the lettering or the... Well, if you scroll up to the first page, mm -hmm. council. So tenant right there is six square feet. That's mm -hmm. six square feet right there. So if you enlarge that a little bit more, you're at 12. And I, I guess this... I. I it could have been presented uh, more clearly, I think, but, and you have to take my word for it, unfortunately, but I, I know that the sign area will be essentially code compliant. You have the issue of the panel. And the, the reason we can't exactly commit to exact square footage of the raised lettering for now is because we really don't know what the tenants, who the tenants are yeah, going to be. That's understood. And, and where the tenant requirements are going to be. Um, mm -hmm. So, so okay. we put in a maximum then in there that this is where the, it would need to you know, squeeze in. Right. Yeah. Mr. Crawford's Mr. Crawford, if I'm hearing your testimony correctly, that maximum would be 22 square feet of yes. lettering. And, and we're, we're looking for that two square feet of wiggle room for a logo or some part of a sign that sticks up high or low. Uh, when I went through the signs at Windsor Plaza, I'm confident that we can make it work. And how many roughly how many signs per tenant? How many signs is each tenant getting when you add them all up? Three? Well, if, if we eliminate the clock tower. Okay. Um, the, the second floor tenants get three plus the free, uh, five second floor tenants. And just to clarify, that's we can go back to the elevation if you want, but that's one on the each of the three sides and not the rear, and then one on each monument sign. Right. Um, um, if, one of the things that, and and you know, the arch, the architect did a nice job of saying, <clears throat> are you trying to fit into the town center uh, vision that we have? Um, <clears throat> keep in mind that existing 206 is will become Main Street in the not too distant future. The signage is not supposed to be highway signage. It's supposed to be Main Street signage. So when you go back and rethink this, and this is up to Mr. Chairman, it's 1030. I don't know if we're gonna to finish tonight. I'd like to take a closer look at the sign package, but this is supposed to be Main Street signage, not highway signage. So keep that in mind, please, when you maybe go back and look at this again. Yeah, just to add to what, you know, what Mr. Masker was saying, I mean, it, <clears throat> the speed limit on what is existing to is going to be dropped down to 25. And preferably people will be, it will be a walkable environment as well. We'll internalize that and, and talk about it. I, I don't necessarily, based upon the testimony that's been provided, see that the, the signage on the building constitutes highway signage. Um, it, it's you know embellished into the building and provides, you know fits in with the architecture, just kind of melds in and provides a nice identification um, for, for buildings that are not actually fronting on the road, but are facing internally to the parking lot. But we can, you know, we'll, we'll take a look at it. All right, oops, I'm still sharing. I forgot I was still sharing, sorry. And so I know we're coming up on 1030 and I forget our rules or do, <clears throat> do we stop taking testimony 1030 or at 11? 10. 
No new testimony after 1030. Oh, no, okay. I have one question, Chairman, for the um, sign, Mr. Mr. Crawford. So in your opinion, uh, the, the signage to draw the customer to the facility is your monument sign on the road, correct? That is correct. And then the sign on the building or wherever else is basically a wayfaring sign is to direct the customer to the appropriate building, correct? That is correct. Identify the use or what, the activity. Right. So um, with your testimonies from previous that the amount of tenants on these buildings may be de minimis as to maybe three or two or a maximum of five tenants per building, um, the choices to go to, if I walk, drive in off 206, for example, and I see one sign for heads, there, I pretty much know that the other building is where I need to go. Um, I mean, it's not like it's a very large shopping center where there are so many choices that I need to have a wayfaring sign to get me to the appropriate place. Um, so I guess in my opinion, Actually, this is what the board can discuss and you can come back and, and maybe do is that uh, the most important is to get the people into the facility from the road. And then at that point, being that it's not a large area, that the customer could probably easily find the appropriate building by looking at the first building they're at and then realize it's not this building and go to the next one. without all the signage that's popped all over the place. That's just my, my thoughts. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I, I agree with what the mayor had said. And, um, you know, as I'm looking at the second story signs, I respectively, um, respectfully disagree. That I don't think they kind of meld into the architecture. I think the architect did a, a really good job of putting design detail, and I think it detracts. Um, and, and again, I think the site is so small that the most important thing to echo the mayor's comments is, you know, find your way to the site. You know that's where your destination is. You find an open parking spot, and the site is small enough that if it's not in the one building, you've done a good job at putting sidewalks on the site, you just you know, go over to the next building. My two cents as well. So in order for us to really analyze, uh, take into consideration and, and you know, revisit this one internally, I just wanna make sure I, I'm understanding what I think I'm hearing um, so that we can take that guidance to heart. It, it seems to me by those last comments from the mayor, Mr. Emick, that we're, you know, the monument signs might not be so much of the issue as the number and size of the tenant signs on the buildings. Is that is that an accurate interpretation? Yes, at least in my opinion. I don't know, Mr. Mask, you have any other thoughts? Well, again, we, we didn't have a whole lot of time to review this. Uh, as you know, freestanding signs are not permitted in this zone, but they are permitted in other parts of the township. We'd like to just sort of compare about compare these signs to what's permitted in other parts of the town just to see how they how they measure up whether they're larger smaller etc I believe in many in certain cases uh, the freestanding where they are permitted you're only allowed to have the name of the development and the address <coughs> not, not a directory sign but we, we can do some comparisons okay well Clearly, we're not going to finish this evening, so we're definitely going to take the board's comments um, and concerns into consideration, and we'll have, um, you know, we'll pull our team together and maybe even reach out to Mr. Maskey to discuss prior to our next hearing. Okay. Right. Actually, Ray, you raised a, Mr. Maskey raised a point um, about building number, address, um, you know, is the one building going to be an address on Animal Road, and the other is going to be 206. Does and I don't know how that works. You know, <clears> building <throat> building one and two, unit A, and I, I didn't see any of that, so I don't know what else. If that's something that the team can consider when resolving this issue. 
we will we will take a look at that. Thank you. Okay, so there's not any more comments from the board. I mean, I got three folks in the public. I just want to give them an opportunity before we uh, wrap for the evening. So anyone from the public would like to question the testimony of this witness? I do not see any. I see none either. Okay. So, Brian, some guidance here going forward that we're going to carry this. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, clearly, we're not going to take any more testimony tonight and uh, need to carry it. Uh, I don't know what your meeting schedule is uh, going forward. Mr. Maskey, you got our calendar. Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, February 4th, we have the return of campus, so that's full. Right. Uh, February 11th, we have JSM, also known as cost cutters returning, so that's pretty full. February 25th is a business meeting. We potentially have two, we have to hear from them yet. Uh, the, the next totally open date would be March 4th. Give me just a second, please. Again, the disadvantage of not being able to sit next to my client and lean over and have a conversation. I apologize. And while I'm waiting for a response from my client, um, I just, I would need to confirm availability of my professionals and, and also would like to confirm with Mr. Hack and the board that we would make an announcement. I would request that announcement be made tonight as to the next date with um, confirmation that no further public notice would be required. That's, that's fine. I'm anticipating a response in a moment. Okay. Uh, March 4th is good for myself and Mr. Seisner. I, I, while we have my, all my professionals here, I'm getting a thumbs up from my planner. Mr. Crawford, are you available on the 4th? Yes, I got a thumbs up there. Uh, Mr. Ford, Mr. Kudazakis, and Mr. Dean are all, Mr. Conrad, I'm Rankati, I got a thumbs up there. Thumbs up from Mike. And uh, yeah, I'm good. Chris, that's, that's Mr. Kudazakis. So yes. it looks like we're all available on March 4th and we would appreciate that. With no, okay, um, Ms. Walters, just uh, your time of decision runs out, looks like February 28th. So we'd need an extension to Agreed. the end uh, of March. Agreed. Okay. Brian, did you get that? Yes. Thank you. Make a motion to, to continue without re-notice to March what, David? Fourth. fourth. March fourth. Second. Okay, any comments from the dais? Okay, roll call please, or yeah, roll call. Mr. Emick? Emick, yes. Mr. Ciccarelli? Yes. Mr. Scobo? Yes. Eason? Yes. Mayor Lapani? Yes. Vice Chair Julian? Yes. Chair Sirachi? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for your time this evening. Um, we will take everything you said into heart, into consideration. We'll regroup and we'll see what we can do to address the, any of those concerns that you've raised tonight. And uh, I'll make sure we get Mr. Maskey an updated uh, package, signed package more than, you know, a couple days in advance with our exhibits. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. Have a good night. Right. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Walter. Right. So board members stay on. Yes, board members hang out. We haven't officially <laughs> turned yet. Sorry. <laughs> That's all good. So as Mr. Maskey said, just a reminder, we do have a meeting next week on the 4th. So and, you know, as always, if anyone's unable to attend, please reach out to the uh, planning office as soon as possible. And with that, Mr. Matsky, unless you have anything else to add? 
Um, no, the only thing I guess the board should have received or it's on civic clerk, there was another, um, a new memo from the environmental commission. Uh, hopefully you've all seen that on the, yeah. campus, on the campus application. Okay, that's it. All right, so with that, may I have a motion to adjourn? Motion, Ron Scobo. All right. Second. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Great, we'll see everyone again.